6. The U.S. Congressional Directory for the year 2000. Order your copy today. Now a hearing on the future of cancer treatment. Today, the House Government Reform Committee heard from officials with the National Cancer Institute, Healthcare Financing Administration, and Food and Drug Administration. Also testifying, family members of cancer patients, including Ohio Representative Deborah Price. being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. Uh, the ranking Democrat, Mr. Waxman, is on his way. He said he'd be a little bit late, but we thought we'd go ahead and get started. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. Today, the Committee on Government Reform begins the first of two days of cancer hearings. During the two days of our hearings, over 3,200 lives will be lost to cancer and 6,575 individuals will be told that they have cancer. This hearing will address four issues. Pediatric cancers and the challenges parents face in making treatment decisions. Racial disparity in cancer treatments. Reimbursement issues related to complementary therapies in an oncology setting and anti-tumor drug development from natural products. Probably the only thing more difficult than personally being diagnosed with cancer is the diagnosis of a cancer for your child. A recent New England Journal of Medicine article stated that one out of four children diagnosed with cancer will die from the disease, one out of four. Unfortunately, many of them will die without a referral to a hospice and with poor pain management. A hospice referral can reduce the fear and pain of children who are terminally ill. In 1999, it was estimated that 7,800 children in the United States would be diagnosed with cancer. 42 families in the United States will be told their child has cancer during the two days of our hearings. They will have to make care and treatment decisions based on what their physicians and oncologists tell them and what they can learn on their own from their family and friends and on the internet. Fortunately, the recent addition of the clinical trials database on the National Institutes of Health website makes it easier for families to learn about clinical trials. Today, my colleague and friend, Congresswoman Deborah Price, will share with us her experience about losing a child to neuroblastoma this past fall. Neuroblastoma is a rare nerve cancer that strikes 500 children in this country each year. Michael and Rafael Horowin lost their only child, two-year-old Alexander. That's a picture of him up there. To medulloblastoma last year. Medulloblastoma is a brain cancer. They have done an excellent job of putting together a chronology of quotes drawn from peer-reviewed medical journals articles on cancer research. The statements show that as parents, they were justified in their concern about the effects of the drugs offered as state of the art. We'll also hear from James Navarro, the father of Thomas. Last summer when Thomas was barely four years old, he was diagnosed with medulloblastoma. That's a picture of him. After researching their options, the family decided that the best course of action for Thomas was a non-toxic treatment available through a Food and Drug Administration approved clinical trial. Unfortunately, the Food and Drug Administration denied Thomas access to this clinical trial because he had not first gone through and failed chemotherapy and radiation. Many of you may recall a hearing two years ago when Dustin Cuneri, that's a picture of Dustin, testified. Dustin, who was the last child that the Food and Drug Administration allowed to receive this treatment as a first choice, is healthy and without having suffering, suffered the life-altering side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. He's not alone in surviving cancer through the use of 
neoplastins and not suffering the irreversible side effects of other more toxic treatments. And you might take a look at him and his family. I think we have some other slides of, uh, is that members of his family there? These are children that survived. Thomas's story struck a chord with many Americans who feel strongly that the decision to access another treatment protocol outside the standard cancer protocols of chemotherapy and radiation should be the patient's choice and not the decision of a government agency. In fact, I have introduced and many of my colleagues have co-sponsored H.R. 3677, the Thomas Navarro Patients' Rights Act, as a re remedy for this situation. This bill would assure that patients would have the option to make an informed decision to participate in clinical trials after being fully informed of all of their options, rather than being forced to accept a treatment with known toxic side effects. Unfortunately, right now, the FDA can put a clinical trial on hold for a treatment that's safe and has no serious side effects because the FDA is satisfied with existing treatments. Even treatments that can cause serious adverse events, including sterility, stunted growth, hormone disorders, blindness, hearing loss, mental retardation, and secondary cancers. H.R. 3677 is a first step in assuring medical freedom in the United States. There's something inherently wrong with the system when doctors threaten to have a child with cancer taken away from parents and put in state custody when they refuse to subject their child to chemotherapy as a means of forcing treatment. How can it be that in the United States of America, a doctor can and will have the state Child Protective Service take a child with cancer away from his or her parents with charges of child neglect and abuse when those parents love their child enough to question administering drugs that can do severe and irreparable harm. These children are then placed in foster care so that the child can be subjected to chemotherapy and radiation. This is exactly how the Navarro and other families have been threatened by government agencies. These threatening tactics by the medical profession on families must stop, and they must stop now. In his State of the Union address on January 22, 1971, President Richard Nixon declared a war on cancer. The thought was that if we took the same approach with curing cancer as we did with putting a man on the moon, pouring lots of funding into the issue, then we could beat cancer. In 1984, the National Cancer Institute's director predicted that cancer deaths would be reduced 50% by the year 2000. And there's a slide showing what the actual situation is. The American taxpayer has invested over $43 billion in the National Cancer Institute, the primary government cancer research agency during the past 29 years. What has the taxpayer investment accomplished? Dr. Robert Whitties will be updating the Committee on the Activities on the National Cancer Institute focusing on the areas of complementary and alternative medicine and natural product drug development. Dr. Steven Strauss, the new director of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, is appearing before the committee for the first time. Surveys indicate that the majority of cancer patients will use some form of complementary or alternative medicine treatment during the course of their disease. Some will integrate complementary therapies with conventional approaches and others will choose a treatment as an alternative to conventional medicine. What has the center accomplished to date? And what are the center's research plans for the future? Earlier this year, Dr. Strauss announced his intentions to develop a frontier sciences research program. Frontier sciences can be defined as areas of science and medicine outside the mainstream, including consciousness studies, subtle ener energies in biology, the scientific basis of alternative and complementary medicine, and the interface of science and spirituality. Research in this area of science will offer significant advances in how we treat and prevent cancer in this new millennium. At some point in the future, we will have a hearing looking specifically at this field. We've asked Dr. Jeffrey Kong of the Healthcare Financing Administration to outline the current and planned activities in reimbursement of complementary and alternative therapies for cancer patients under Medicare. Dr. Robert Pazder will present 
testimony about clinical trials and alternative cancer treatments on behalf of the Food and Drug Administration. He's been asked to provide information about the number and types of calls received regarding these types of clinical trials. We received complaints from families who, when calling the FDA to gain information about possible inclusion in the antinoplastin clinical trials, were offered negative information about Dr. Brzezinski's clinical trials. These individuals felt that the FDA staff was attempting to dissuade patient participation. We'll also hear from Dr. Jer Jeremy Giffen, who we asked to return and specifically address reimbursement challenges from the perspective of an, on 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 an oncologist in private practice who integrates complementary therapies in his treatment. Mr. Roger Carey, the Chief Operating Officer of Cancer Treatment Centers of America, has learned that patients fare better when allowed to select an integrated treatment approach, including therapeutic nutrition, spiritual care, exercise and massage therapy programs, and naturopathic medicine. Unfortunately, as long as most complementary therapies are not reimbursed, the best approach to treating cancer, an integrated approach, remains available only to those who have the means to pay out of pocket. The poor people just don't have a chance to be involved in that. Dr. George DeVeres, President and Chief Executive Officer of American Specialty Health Plans, will share with us how 25 million Americans who've been able to access complementary and alternative therapies through complementary and alternative medicine benefits programs, network programs, and discount network programs have been beneficial. The challenges of cancer are immense and complex and at times very emotional. And anyone who's had anybody in their family that's had cancer knows what I'm talking about. Last year, within a two-month span, I lost both of my parents to lung cancer. My wife is a six-year survivor from breast cancer. In large part, I believe, due to her participation in a clinical trial to test an alternative cancer <coughs> protocol, she survived. As a committee and a Congress, we must remain vigilant in our oversight of the war on cancer and look for ways to improve research, access, and care. The hearing record will remain open until June 21st for those who'd like to submit a statement for the hearing record. Mr. Waxman is not yet here. Mr. Schakowsky, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make in place of Mr. Waxman? Well, I'm not speaking on behalf of Mr. Waxman, but if I could just say a few words, Mr. Chairman. General ladies recognized. There was a fascinating story in yesterday's Wall Street Journal about um, a treatment for a kind of leukemia um, and clinical trials that were um, that were being used in a limited way. And this information got out over the internet where patients now are engaging much more in their own research and their own discovery of alternatives. And suddenly there was this vast number of people who wanted to participate in this clinical trial, which um, presents new opportunities, but also a lot of new challenges. The manufacturer, how are they going to produce in quantity? What is the role of government in regulating that? On the other hand, a completely understandable, and were I a, a cancer victim or a family member, I would certainly want this option available. So I think this con your legislation and this discussion and this hearing about what is the balance of protecting health and safety and making sure that life-saving options are available to, to people and that we're not interfering with, with that in an unreasonable way is, is most important. So I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the witnesses today for this uh, important hearing. Thank you. Do any other members have uh, statements they'd like to make uh, at, the, at the beginning here? If not, I'd like to welcome our dear friend and colleague, uh, Congresswoman Deborah Price, one of the leaders here in Congress, to come forth and, and testify. And we welcome you uh, second time I've seen you today with our good friend uh, Dave Thomas, and we're glad to have you. Uh, you're recognized to make an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My statement is uh, somewhat lengthy, and I will do my very best to uh, cut it down and stay within the committee's time frame. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have been together twice today, once to celebrate the unveiling of the adoption stamp, with, which we both worked very hard on, and now to talk about cancer. Adoption and cancer, those are two issues that have profoundly touched my life, one in a very happy and joyous way, and the other in the most heartbreaking. 
As many of you know, my family recently waged a battle against cancer that eventually claimed the life of my adopted daughter, Caroline. Today, I would like to share with you my own experience navigating our health care system in an effort to provide Caroline with the best care possible. After three trips to the pediatrician's office to determine the cause of pain in her left leg, Caroline was finally diagnosed with cancer in September of 1998. I cannot begin to describe the horror and confusion that a parent faces. Unfortunately, the initial diagnosis of the cancer was incorrect. But based on this misdiagnosis, we brought Caroline to the National Institutes of Health, where there was a study underway focused on Ewing sarcoma, which we were told was the disease from which she, with which she suffered. After a couple of weeks of testing at NIH, the doctors began to doubt Caroline's diagnosis. We then learned that an even worse fate was in store for us. Caroline had neuroblastoma, a very rare nerve cancer with a survival rate of less than 20% of children like Caroline. Once again, we had to start over and make decisions about where to seek treatment, what treatment, who to believe and who to trust. And NIH provided a list of neuroblastoma programs across the country, but the doctors were reluctant to make a decision and everybody had their own way of treating it and we had to decide which was the best course. After much, much research, phone calls, and networking, we seized on what we thought was our best opportunity at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. Caroline bravely endured months of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and even a brief clinical remission before the cancer claimed her life. So, in my view, there are a number of improvements that need to be made in the manner in which our current health care system treats pediatric cancer. First of all, members of the committee, I believe that pediatricians and parents need a wake-up call. Cancer strikes over 10,000 children in this country every year. It is the leading cause of death by disease in children. It is the leading cause of death by disease in children. Parents have to be aware of this fact, and pediatricians should be trained to look for even the most subtle form of care, subtle signs of cancer, and improve screening of children for the disease. Children are much more likely to have their symptoms dismissed. We were told at first it was shin splints, and then we were told that it was growing pains. They're much more likely to have their symptoms dismissed, and that delays treatment and it certainly delays diagnosis. In children, this is especially detrimental because pediatric cancer spread rapidly. Pediatricians must resist tendencies to offer a perfunctory examination of children with seemingly innocuous symptoms and just dismiss them. A simple x-ray or blood test would only add a small cost to our healthcare system and could have the invaluable benefit of timely and successful treatment. Now, of course, once cancer is diagnosed, it's crucial that the type of cancer be correctly identified so that the appropriate course of treatment may be, may be initiated as soon as possible. Through my interactions with other parents, I have discovered that we were not alone in our misdiagnosis. In fact, Memorial Sloan Kettering confirmed that misdiagnosis of small red cell or small round cell tumors at an atypical age is not uncommon and perhaps is as high as 20%. Now, I know that this committee is looking at alternative and complementary therapies, so let me just address that very briefly. In our own experience, these therapies were not overtly presented at all. Chairman Burton, I think you were the only person in the whole course of our treatment to even suggest that we look into it, and I appreciate that. Um, but we did not seek them out. We had our hands and heads full enough just wading through the many options that traditional therapies offered. However, therapies such as exposure to music, or art, and play, medical play especially, and other distractions to keep the patient's focus on something other than treatment and or pain were available through the institutions where Caroline was treated, and I view them as very positive influences in her care. 
Now, beyond treatment decisions, knowledge is crucial to parents because they are the ones who must be the advocates for their children in the cancer system. In the judicial system, which I am more familiar with, we are making more and better use of uh, court-appointed special advocates, or CASAs, to help coordinate and protect the interests of children. There is no such animal in the healthcare system. If we had not made it our business to know and understand every step of every procedure, many irreversible mistakes would have been made, I believe, some of which were as serious as having the wrong kind of catheter inserted into our daughter surgically, to as minor but every bit as significant to a little child as having a nurse have to stop placing an IV that wasn't necessary because she could have drawn blood from the catheter. Every step of the way, you have to be vigilant. Unfortunately, Palliative care is also a very real part of cancer treatment that has, to a certain extent, been neglected. As a parent watching my child suffer, I could not understand why more relief could not be provided in the hospital setting at the end of Caroline's life compared to what was available in hospice care. In my mind, there is absolutely no reason that there has to be such a bright line between pain relief offered at the last stage of aggressive treatment in a hospital and that offered when alleviating pain through the hospice system. Sadly, studies based on parental reports show that 89% of children experience substantial suffering in the last month of life. This study also shows a discrepancy between what parents and physicians perceive about children's symptoms. There are a number of obstacles that stand in the way of effective pain management for children, including perceptions about their threshold for pain, the ability of children to effectively communicate their pain, and concerns about addictions, and that's just to name a few. There is great need for more training and research in this area. <coughs> I also believe there's a need for more home hospice care for children. While we were fortunate enough to have this option, it's not often available in many communities for many reasons. The demand is oftentimes low, thank God, but it's also difficult to staff these organizations as people generally don't want to even think about hospice care for children. In the interest of these kids, we have to improve education through knowledge and we have to change attitudes. Now, thankfully, not all children suffer Caroline's fate. Tremendous progress has been made in the last 30 years, and today childhood cancer is, very, uh, is a very curable disease in three quarters of the patients. Now, I have to qualify, uh, qualify this by saying that it's largely due to great strides in the cure for leukemia. Solid tumor cancers are still horrible killers and claim a great number of our children. Continued research is the hope for cancer patients in the new millennium. The triumphs over can childhood cancer are to be celebrated, there, but there continue to be limitations on pediatric research. Each child di diagnosed with cancer is getting only one-sixth of the federal research support allocated to each patient afflicted with age, AIDS. And for every dollar spent on patient, a patient with breast cancer, less than 30 cents is spent on a child with cancer. We need to invest more resources in pediatric cancer with a focus on increasing survival and accessibility to care. We need also to do more to provide incentives for new drug development, which is currently lacking due in part to a very small market and to liability issues that we're all aware of. Cooperation among medical institutions, philanthropic organizations, and the federal government can move us toward the day in the new millennium where there is hope for all children and no child need fall victim to the scourge that is cancer. I thank the committee for their indulgence. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me just say uh, on behalf of the committee that uh, we uh, sympathize with you and, and we pray for you and your family. I know it's been a very difficult time. I, I watched you go through that. I know all of my colleagues did and uh, uh, it, 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 uh, when you see a good friend go through that or somebody in your family go through that, it, 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 you feel it too from afar, not nearly like you did. But uh, you're a heck of a woman and we're very pleased that you were with us today and thank you. Thank does, you does anybody have any questions? 
Ms. Jankowski. I just wanted to say thank you for your testimony. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I think it's uh, important that um, these personal experiences be related. And um, cancer has touched us all. And Mr. Chairman and committee members, it's wonderful that you're exploring this. And I, I, I give you great credit. And I appreciate the work you're doing here. I have just a, a few questions real briefly, if, uh, if you don't mind answering them. You testified about the needing uh, to improve hospice care for children. Uh, can you tell us how existing hospices improve their services for children, how they can improve their services for children? Well, I think that um, the hospice care that we uh, underwent was excellent. Unfortunately, the problem that we experienced is that we were not really released from traditional treatment until three days before her death, although I think it was obvious to her physician that um, things were imminent, and I wish we had sought hospice earlier. Uh, I think hospice care is something that um, I don't have any problems with it as we experienced it, but I do know that it's not available in some sectors of the country and in many communities, especially as it relates to kids. People have a hard time seeing p children be ill, and it's very difficult to watch a child die, and that's what hospice nurses and hospice personnel do, and I think it's just a matter of changing attitudes and, and better educating folks, and um, it's a, such an important thing. I, I don't want to cause you any additional pain by asking these questions, but you, you, should, you talked about a difference between uh, how her pain was managed while she was in the hospital and, and in hospice care. Can, can, can you be a little more definitive on that, Robert? Absolutely. We, we were giving Caroline um, a few last doses of radiation treatment before we left because we thought that would shrink uh, the tumor in her brain and the spine and perhaps um, alleviate some of the pain. We were doing that to reduce pain. But the, um, the physician in control of uh, anesthesia at the, uh, at the cancer center where she was getting the radi radiation wouldn't even allow her to have a Valium for fear that, for whatever reason, she wouldn't say that, that Caroline perhaps would die. We all knew she was dying. Um, and therefore, she couldn't relax, and she moved around, and it was extra painful for her. Um, that was the afternoon that we checked out of the hospital and went home. And at that point, um, she had large doses of Valium and um, other drugs to control her pain, which, um, I mean, we were just asking for one small dose, and it, it was denied her, and that's when we said, this is enough, enough, it's definitely enough. So <laughs> there, there doesn't have to be such a, fine, a, a bright line between what they can do in the hospital and what they can do at home. I don't understand it at all. Did anyone uh, uh, talk to you about alternative pain, uh, possible remedies like acupuncture or anything? Anybody no, talk? that was never, ever broached to us. Never even talked to you about that. You mentioned that your daughter's cancer was misdiagnosed repeatedly. Uh, do you feel that uh, doctors don't think of serious illnesses such as cancer when a child comes in with symptoms like, like pain? I absolutely feel that way. Um, uh, our pediatrician group uh, saw her at least twice, and I think three times, with uh, this complaint in her leg, and there was never so much as an x-ray ordered or anything. They did some manipulation and um, questioning of, of my daughter. Other than that, um, they just dismissed it outright as just the growing process or shin splints or, or whatever. Um, and she was even dragging her leg behind her. She couldn't put uh, Any pressure. pressure on it at all. And those symptoms were clearly stated, but uh, dismissed. Well, uh, do uh, gentlelady from Florida. Thank you so much, Mr. Burton. I just want to thank my good pal, Deb, for the grace and dignity which she has uh, bestowed upon this uh, institution with the way that she conducted herself through these difficult times. And like you said, Mr. Chairman, our prayers are with her and Randy. And, uh, you know, we love you, Deb. Thank you. I felt that all, all along the way from my colleagues, and it's so much appreciated. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you very much for being here and sharing that with us. Uh, we are, have some votes on the floor. We'll stand in recess until the votes are over, and we'll come right back. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, uh, for those who are going to be testifying, can I have your attention real quickly, please? For those who are going to be testifying, I understand we're going to have five or six votes on the floor, which means we'll have 15 minutes in the first vote, and that will be followed by uh, five five-minute votes. So we'll be gone for about an hour, and I really apologize for the uh, time problem, but uh, I can't control the floor, so we'll be back as soon as possible. Thank you. You, you can rest or take a little time off. Elijah Cummins, one of our members, is not here today, but uh, I wanted to extend condolences on behalf of the committee because uh, his father passed away yesterday. So I hope those in the minority will be sure to extend our condolences to uh, Representative Cummins. I know it's a tough time for him. Our second panel is uh, Dr. Strauss, Dr. Witties. Uh, Dr. Kong and Dr. Pazder, would you please come forward? And while they're coming forward, I'd like to thank uh, the ladies who, uh, and the families that gave me this pin, who lost their children to cancer. I, I will wear this with great pride, and I want to thank you very much for thinking of me. We'll try to make sure that uh, your loss was not, uh, not in vain. Maybe we can get some things done that'll make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen in the future, or at least it's minimized. Uh, would you gentlemen, uh, let's see, do we have everybody? Dr. Kong, Dr. Wittes, we do not have yet. Uh, Dr. Pazder, are they still here? Yes, they were downstairs. Oh, they were downstairs having coffee? Well, is there anybody who can run and grab their coffee cup and then lead them up here? Coffee drinkers will follow their coffee cup. <laughs> We will have more members come as, uh, as, uh, as time progresses. I ran back here, that's why I'm perspiring, because I didn't want to hold you folks up any longer. So we have now Dr. Witties with us. Now we're waiting on Dr. Pazder. He's, is he down having coffee? Hello, does anybody know? Well, why don't we go ahead and get started, and uh, uh, I'll... Uh, I'll uh, Swear him in when he gets back. Would you gentlemen please rise? Are you Dr. Pazder? Come in, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Oh, he's in the men's room. It's after, all, it's after all that coffee. Have a seat. We'll, we'll wait just a minute. Here. When he comes in, we'll, we all know uh, that. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay, Mr. Pa Dr. Pazder? Well, we, we understand you had coffee and we had a stop on the way, and we're glad you're prepared for the hearing. I apologize to you once again for the delay in our hearing. Would you please rise, please? You, you swear to raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth tonight about the truth, so you got it. I do. Let's see. Thank you, and let the record reflect that the witnesses responded in the affirmative. And uh, on behalf of the committee, I want to welcome you all here today. Uh, you're all recognized to uh, make an opening statement, if you please. We'll start with uh, Dr. Strauss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to appear before the committee uh, for the first time and to address the opportunities that complementary and alternative medicine has uh, to offer in the management of cancer. Uh, as you commented in your opening remarks, about two in five Americans uh, rely on some forms of complementary and alternative medicine, and more than four in five cancer patients do so by the survey uh, conducted by our colleague, our new colleague in NCAM, Dr. Mary Ann Richardson, when she was our grantee at the University of Texas in Houston. The vast majority of this use is complementary in nature to alleviate the terrible symptoms and complications, and the minority is as alternative therapy. 
I can tell you as one who has lost loved ones to cancer, uh, I understand the desperation and the need of the patients, but I wouldn't attempt to be as eloquent uh, as uh, the Honorable Speaker was prior to the break in speaking about the needs of her child. But as a physician, however, I could say that um, I understand the frustration that we face on a daily basis knowing that we cannot provide our patients everything that they truly need. My responsibility as a science and as, as a scientist and as the first director of NCAM, however, really requires me to take the long-term look to invest in approaches in a rigorous fashion that will provide the American public the definitive answers they need for the future. There are very good reasons to think that some CAM modalities uh, would be beneficial. Uh, we know that to be the case of some indications uh, uh, of botanicals, uh, such as St. John's Word for Depression. And we've also been learning as we're studying these modalities increasingly of unanticipated uh, adverse reactions. The imperative to us to study them carefully is even greater. And if you look at today's New England Journal of Medicine, there's a cautionary tale from Europe of a Chinese herb that not only did not succeed in alleviating suffering, but caused cancer in women. So this is a complex and challenging enterprise. And NCAM's approach is to harness the tools of rigorous science in a very open-minded fashion. Uh, our strategic plan for doing so is now posted on our website for public comment and it outlines the tiered approach that we're going to use. Cancer is one of our most important targets. We survey the entire field of medicine in our efforts, uh, but by virtue of the needs of cancer patients, this is a priority for us. Shortly after assuming directorship, I met with Dr. Richard Klausner, the director of NCI. We've met multiple times since then. I meet with Dr. Wittes and with, his doctor, with Dr. Jeff White, his colleague, uh, on a monthly basis to discuss uh, a joint portfolio uh, to make sure we're harnessing our collaborative resources as well as possible. Our portfolio is still evolving. We've just completed our first year uh, in NCAM, having been established in February of 99. And our budget for this year invests in cancer at three times what it did last year. Uh, and our best judgment for our budget uh, expected uh, potential for 2001 would be an additional doubling. We are already uh, funding uh, in a collaborative project with the NCI uh, the first large definitive trial of shark cartilage as a therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, we are investing in um, controversial therapies as well, such as the study at Columbia University of uh, Dr. Gonzalez's nutritional approach uh, to the management of pancreatic cancer, for which the standard therapies are suboptimal. With the NCI, we've agreed to use a novel and expedited review process known as the Quick Trials Mechanism for Funding Grants. And we jointly benefit from the availability and the advice of the Cancer Advisory Panel and Complementary Alternative Medicine CAPCAM, who has the responsibility, among others, to bring us novel therapies through the best case series mechanism. Uh, we are currently funding uh, exploring two such best case series studies, and we're looking forward in the September meeting to additional ones. Uh, this very week, we reviewed for the first time uh, large center applications that we will fund one or two of in this coming year. All of these efforts combined uh, need to be communicated effectively to the American public, and we do so with a very aggressive communications and outreach portfolio. Uh, in my first months in NCAM, I realized that our fact sheets and our written material provided by the clearinghouse is inadequate. Um, we are currently engaged in writing 46 of them, including 10 on cancer alone, together with the NCI. We are also funding, starting today, Jim Gordon's conference on comprehensive cancer care, which I have the pleasure of addressing Saturday. So in my first several months, uh, I've joined an active and dynamic group. We've doubled its size already in the past uh, seven months. We look forward to building uh, an aggressive and uh, very excellent scientific portfolio addressing CAM and cancer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, Dr. Strauss. Uh, Dr. Witties, uh, would you like to address the committee? Um, <clears throat> my name is Robert Wittes. I'm the Deputy Director for Extramural Science at the National Cancer Institute. With me is Dr. Jeff White, who is the Director of the Cancer Institute's Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And it's a pleasure for us to be here today as well to tell you about some of the progress we've made in the areas of interest to the committee. The title of the hearings today, Integrative Oncology, is a is an interesting way of expressing the notion that our object really in medicine and in oncology specifically is to put together everything that we know for the benefit of the patient, whatever it is and wherever it comes from. Now, in, in order to do that in the best way, um, you have to have high standards for evidence because ultimately things hang on the answer to the question, does it work? Um, and it has seemed to us, and it seems to many people, this is not a unique insight, that there can't be multiple different standards surrounding the issue of how rigorous evidence needs to be. And um, it, it's probably worth commenting that that's actually a rather recent notion in medicine. If medicine is four or 5,000 years old, or however old it is, then that's a notion that's actually only come of age in the last half century or so. And it has pervaded the medical community, actually, gradually over that period of time. And um, I, I would say also perhaps some, somewhat unevenly. Different, different people have themselves different standards of evidence for what the judgment of what works. And so when one is talking about the mainstream medical community and the uh, complementary and alternative medicine community, there uh, is sometimes the assumption that there is a two cultures issue here. Um, but I think times are changing, and I'm, I'm, my own observation is that there are enough like-minded people on both sides of the mainstream and alternative communities to meet in the middle and to interact productively in ways that will really move the evaluation of evidence in the direction that I think most of us think it ought to be moving. Now, there's, there's evidence that this is already happening, I think, and uh, one can see the establishment of uh, complementary and alternative medicine units in academic medical centers and in some medical school curricula. Uh, the meeting here in Washington that Dr. Strauss just referred to is, I think, an example of, of, a, of an organizational effort that has really made an effort to bring all the various people and constituencies that are interested in the care of the patient together to see whether this kind of integration can occur at the care level and also at the research level. Um, there have been multiple actions by the NIH, various parts of the NIH, to bridge the gap between mainstream and CAM communities, and Dr. Strauss has already mentioned several of them. Um, and I have uh, summarized these, uh, the, the, the NCI contribution to this in my written testimony, which um, I'm, of course, submitting in parallel with these oral comments. Um, the organization of the Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine in the Cancer Institute is actually a, a sort of an organizational embodiment of our belief that it would be wrong for us to isolate complementary and alternative medicine from the activities of the rest of the Institute. And the reason we were interested in setting this up as a coordinating office within, within, within our Institute was so that everywhere that it made sense within the Institute, the various programs that we have could begin to address um, matters that are currently called complementary and alternative. Um, and I think we've started to do this. The organization of the CAPCAM with, with jointly with the, with the, the NCCAM uh, is an example of how we are attempting to integrate expertise from both communities. We have a very aggressive best case series program, which we started a number of years ago actually, to try to elicit from the community of complementary and alternative practitioners evidence bodies of evidence that they have obtained in the process of their practices that should be considered by the medical community at large for action. And we're trying to um, aggressively advertise the existence of this process in the hope that people will come forward and bring uh, ideas that they have, uh, evidence that they have about interventions to us. Uh, Dr. White has done a terrific job of writing letters to about 150 different people about this. Uh, we have a leaflet that's going to be distributed at the uh, conference here. We have a website now that advertises the details of this, and we'll go into further detail um, uh, as it's developed. And th th this is actually a major focus of our, of our um, 
of the impetus that we, we have to try to bring these communities together and, and uh, evaluate evidence that looks promising. Um, we have started um, a clinical trials effort, and Dr. Strauss has mentioned some of the um, uh, examples of this. I have also to mention that there is a, um, a new evaluation panel, a peer review evaluation panel for clinical oncology um, uh, proposals that span the spectrum of clinical oncology that I expect um, will be the perfect place for complementary and alternative medicine investigators to come in with clinical proposals. My expectation is that they will get a fair review in that setting. And I've asked Dr. White to pay particular attention to the flow of applications into the Institute and to, to make sure that um, uh, CAM issues are adequately represented on that committee. In the matter of providing information, uh, we're working closely with the NCCAM about this. Our um, protocol database, CancerNet, which, uh, part of which, PDQ, has been in existence since uh, the mid-1980s or so, has recently been totally revamped and updated. And as part of this, we, uh, a couple of years ago, decided to take down a lot of the information that we had on complementary and alternative approaches for the reason that uh, Dr. Strauss already mentioned, that we, we just considered them inadequate. And we have been rebuilding this and putting it back up and um, attempting to have uh, fair-minded and complete evidence-based uh, reviews of uh, what's going on in, in the CAM area. Um, so let me just, in the interest of time, move on quickly to uh, the natural products area, because I know that's of, of interest to you, Mr. Chairman, in particular. Um, th this is an area, of course, that's very old in medicine. It's about as mainstream as you can get, um, but with important conceptual links, interesting conceptual links to the world of, of complementary medicine, alternative medicine. Um, for natural products, one thinks of a whole variety of, of, of medicines in medicine, morphine for pain, quinine derivatives for cardiac irregularities, digitalis for uh, heart failure any number of antibiotics for bacterial infections, and um, the statins for cholesterol lowering, and of course, vincristine, vinblastine, doxorubicin, captathecans, taxol, taxotere, and other anti-cancer uh, drugs, all have come from one or another corner of the natural world. Um, now, the notion of the natural world as a repository of, of medicinal chemicals actually provides a pretty clear conceptual link between the world of hard science on the one hand and the world of alternative practices on the other. There's nothing complementary or alternative about natural products chemistry. Um, what you have there is a body of really rigorous science that can be used to explain, if we're clever about it, real observations that are made with natural substances uh, that may come out of uh, the experience of, of practitioners that are uh, doing empirical kinds of therapies that they have a feeling work and they have observed seem to work. The issue for us is really to tack this down as much as possible and make it as rigorous as possible. Now there are some interesting complexities and differences in the approaches between these two worlds. Natural products chemists tend to be really interested in pure compounds. They're interested in fishing out pure compounds from impure extracts and trying to define what's active and what's not within these extracts. Whereas traditional practitioners and traditional kinds of medical practice frequently emphasize the efficacy of complex mixtures. And so one of the things that we're going to have to confront as an institute in the not too distant future is this matter of how we can rigorously evaluate the kinds of complex mixtures that may come to the best case series and may possibly look good to the people who are doing the evaluations in the best case series. So where do we want to go with all of this? Um, we actually feel that the natural products effort is so important even in the changing scientific context that we're in now that we really want to strengthen it. Um, the search for new drugs involves basically the answer to two questions. Where do you look for the new drugs? And how do you look for them? The traditional answer to the where question is in the natural world. You look, and that's why natural products are so important. People have looked there. Um, the traditional answer to the how do you look question is you set up screens, you set up assays of some sort based on some empirical effect in the case of cancer, like cell killing, and then you expose the assay to mixtures of natural products or synthetic chemicals, and you see what happens. And that's how a lot of drugs have been discovered. 
Both these things are changing now, actually. They're changing in remarkable ways. The answer to the where question is now not only natural products and pure chemicals, it is complex combinatorial libraries that, that, that clever chemists can actually synthesize in their laboratories, generating huge amounts of chemical diversity there. The answer to the how question is now no longer empirical, but involves concentration on molecular targets. And the Wall Street Journal article yesterday that was already mentioned uh, with the new compound for leukemia is an example, actually, of a synthetic search for um, a ligand to a molecular target. The key point about this, and the reason I'm bringing this up in this kind of detail, is that these changes, the increasing amount of science in cancer drug discovery now, do not make natural products less important. In fact, they probably, in some, some sense, they probably make them more important because the natural world is probably the best single place to find out a diversity of structures that no chemist, no matter how smart, would ever have had the insight to synthesize to ligate a particular target that might be useful against cancer. And so we are currently thinking about ways to increase this resource and broaden it so it's not only an internal resource for the Institute, but it's made available to, on a, probably on a competitive basis, to discovery laboratories around the country that wish to employ natural products in their own discovery efforts. I think in the interest of time, I'll stop here and... and Thank you, Dr. Wittes. We'll, we'll get uh, back to you with some questions shortly. Uh, Dr. Kong? I was going to say he could have my time. It means I didn't have to testify, but I'm kidding. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished committee members, Thank you for inviting us to discuss Medicare coverage for complementary and coverage for complementary and alternative therapies and experimental treatments, as well as our efforts to uh, address racial disparities in healthcare. Uh, we are well aware of the increasing integration of alternative therapies into conventional therapy. I have referred my own patients for treatments such as acupuncture in my own private practice. However, for Medicare coverage and payment to be made, there must be reliable scientific evidence that a treatment is reasonable and necessary. To date, there has been a paucity of such evidence for complementary and alternative modalities, and we are actually uh, um, eager and anxious to work with our colleagues at NIH, FDA, and um, the National Center for uh, Complementary and Alternative Medicine uh, to address the necessary evidence needed for Medicare coverage decisions. Once that evidence is generated that Dr. Wittes and Dr. Strauss referred to and it's adequate, uh, we will move quickly to provide coverage whenever and wherever that evidence is sufficient uh, within the limits of our statutorily defined benefit categories. Um, for experimental therapies, um, Medicare has historically not covered them because they do not meet the statutory requirement for reasonable and necessary. However, as the President uh, announced this morning, uh, we will explicitly authorize payment for routine patient care costs associated with clinical trials. Uh, furthermore, the President uh, asked us uh, by executive order this morning to report to him within 90 days regarding the feasibility and advisability of providing additional financial support for the non-covered or non-routine costs associated with clinical trials. Um, we want to do all we can to help generate the kind of data we need to make prompt coverage decisions on experimental and alternative treatments. Um, our new open and accountable coverage determination process will help that. Uh, for example, um, um, we, uh, following our testimony last fall, um, my agency's testimony last fall to this committee, um, we actually thoroughly reviewed all of the studies cited in the National Institutes of Health uh, Consensus Conference on Acupuncture in 1997. Um, that conference concluded that the scientific evidence suggests that acupuncture is promising for the treatment of conditions such as chemotherapy-related nausea and vomiting uh, and post-operative dental pain. Um, we will actually use that information cited there as a starting point uh, and we have just initiated uh, a national coverage determination process to look at um, that those two indications for coverage in Medicare. Uh, and we are requesting any additional scientific information that's been generated since 1997. We also have several initiatives underway to address racial disparities in care. We are particularly uh, focusing on medical, making health care and health care information understandable and attainable for all populations. And we are stressing the importance of cultural competency, which emphasizes the, the need to recognize and respect the use 
of, tr of beneficiaries' traditional treatments and beliefs from whatever cultures they may come from, and then to integrate them into the conventional medical care that we pay for. Uh, we greatly appreciate the desire of this committee for wider coverage of alternative and experimental therapies and steps to address racial disparities in care. We will continue to work closely with our colleagues um, uh, on this panel today to develop the scientific knowledge and evidence we need uh, for coverage. Uh, we will also move quickly to implement the revised coverage policy regarding routine costs announced by the President today. Uh, and we are committed to working to address reducing racial disparities. Um, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, testify today and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. <clears throat> Doctor. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am uh, Richard Pazder, MD, Director of the Division of Oncology Drug Products in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration. Prior to coming to the FDA nine months ago, I was at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston for 11 years where I was involved in patient care, research, medical education, and administration. To the extent that information is publicly available, I would like to address the specific issues in your letter. We understand that cancer patients and their families are often unfamiliar with the FDA's statutory responsibilities. To more thoughtfully work with the concerns of cancer patients and families, the FDA hired staff in 1994 who are available to answer questions and discuss concerns. I would now like to address the issues in your letter. Our primary obligations are those vested in us by Congress in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to help ensure that marketed medical drugs, drugs are properly labeled, safe, and effective, and that the procedures and studies conducted on unapproved drugs are designed to protect the vulnerable, particularly patients with life-threatening diseases such as cancer. The FDA is interested in good clinical studies and data independent of the type of therapy used. It does not matter whether a drug is labeled alternative, complementary, or conventional. You asked us to address patient access to unapproved drugs. The access process starts with a sponsor, usually a drug company, seeking to develop a new drug. Testing experimental drugs in patients presents medical and ethical dilemmas. Medical and ethical standards prohibit substitution of an unproven drug where curative treatments are available. For example, in the initial treatment of Hodgkin's disease, testicular cancer, childhood leukemia, and medulloblastoma, there are curative therapies. Therefore, the use of an unproven drug before the standard therapy has been used is medically imprudent and ethically unacceptable. The ideal mechanism for a patient to receive a promising but unproven drug is in a controlled clinical trial. Such trials provide appropriate patient protections and potential benefits. It is not always possible, however, for each patient who might benefit from the drug to enroll in clinical trials. Our regulations allow patients to have access, access to unapproved drugs even though they cannot enter clinical trials. In the drug development process, the sponsor must decide whether it is willing to make the unapproved drug available for an individual patient. If the sponsor is not willing, even if the FDA has no objections, the patient will not be able to obtain the unapproved drug. One may ask, why is the FDA involved in this process? Because the FDA has access to confidential information about the safety of the unapproved agent, our participation in the decision-making process is critical. We work closely with the sponsor and the patient's physician. For patients for whom no curative therapy exists, our practice has been to liberally allow patients access to unapproved drugs. Mr. Chairman, you asked, can an unapproved therapy believed to be less toxic be tried prior to a curative therapy that has known serious adverse events? The answer is no. The most important aspect of any potential cancer therapy is the likelihood for prolonging life or hopefully cure. Indirectly, drugs can be harmful if they lead people to delay or reject proven therapies, possibly worsening their condition. The first chance for cure is the best chance for cure. 
This is because progressive tumor growth and deterioration in a patient's health makes subsequent therapy much more difficult. Researchers are always focusing on the goal of new and better treatments with minimal side effects. For example, in childhood leukemia, progress has been made in improving the cure rate and decreasing the toxicity. With careful observation and no compromise in cure rate, well-designed clinical trials allow the development of less toxic therapies. Now the cure rates for some types of childhood leukemias are greater than 90%. Mr. Chairman, we are often asked the question, how should we balance public health protection with personal autonomy? We think the Congress has established the balance correctly in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. As a practicing oncologist for over 20 years, I understand that some patients will never stop seeking children, will never stop seeking treatment that they think might help them. Our regulations protect the public from unsafe and ineffective drugs, but also are flexible and allow desperately ill patients access to promising unapproved therapies. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. I would appreciate if my full written record would be uh, entered in the record. I will be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Doctor. And Dr. Pezder, let me uh, start with you. As an expert in colon and rectal cancer, can you uh, please state your expertise in medulloblastoma? Uh, in medulloblastoma, uh, I do not treat pediatric oncology patients. The decision at the FDA regarding uh, NDAs, special exemptions to NDAs for pediatric oncology drugs is handled by a board-certified pediatric oncologist. Uh, this is reviewed by myself and is also reviewed by a team leader who is a board-certified medical oncologist and also at the office level. In cases... I guess the answer is you do not have any expertise in medical. I am not a pediatric medical oncologist. Yeah. Well, I didn't need to have that whole history there. I just wanted to ask you that question. Do you have any expertise in that area? And you say no. No, not. I do not have personal expertise in that area. Uh, you're familiar with the legislation that I've sponsored, uh, I, I presume, aren't you? What uh, the uh, the Thomas Navarro bill? I have read it, yes. You're familiar with the, the situation with the Thomas Navarro boy? I am intimately uh, aware of the case. We have spent many hours considering uh, this, our decision in this. Can uh, you tell me what the case. side effects are for uh, chemotherapy and radiation on a person who has uh, that uh, ailment? Okay. The side effects for chemotherapy and radiation and the discussion of toxicities need to be individualized for a given patient. Well, let's, okay. let's, let's, let's be a little bit more general than that. Do you have a list of the side effects that we have, uh, we found out about uh, with uh, chemotherapy and radiation? And the reason I bring that up, doctor, is because um, in the case of that boy and several others that we've had contact with, the side effects uh, mental retardation, uh, uh, a whole host of them, which I'll read to you in just a moment, uh, cause a lot of the parents to be very concerned about uh, about Dr. Brzezinski's treatment down there uh, and, and how it might be uh, as effective or more effective without the potential side effects. Uh, the adver adverse events, uh, we understand, include sterility, stunted growth, hormone disorders, blindness, hearing loss, mental retardation, mental retardation, and secondary cancers. Now, in the case of the boy we're talking about and others that have had this kind of treatment that Dr. Brzezinski has advocated and, and performed on there in a clinical trial, I might add, uh, they have had some pretty good results. And we've talked to some of the parents who've had some remarkable results with this kind of treatment. And yet, because... Uh, the Navarro boy's parents did not want him to go through the potential side effects that might uh, arise from chemotherapy and radiation. They decided that they wanted to have the alternative therapy that's in a clinical trial that Dr. Brzezinski has proposed. The problem that they ran into was they said that he could not take the alternative therapy, which is in a clinical trial, until 
he had taken chemotherapy and radiation. And they went so far as to say that if he did not take the chemo and radiation first, which had these potential side effects, that the state agencies might come in and take the boy from the parents and force the foster parent, or whoever took charge of the child, to give the boy chemotherapy and radiation in spite of the possibilities of the alternative of the side effects. And so I guess my question is this. Why should that family or any family, when there's a clinical trial going on, have to go through what they perceive to be a real danger to their child, chemotherapy and radiation, when there is another approach in clinical trials that might provide better treatment and longer survivability for the child? The answer to the question is a very complicated answer. When we're dealing basically with a decision of therapy, there is a question of efficacy and toxicity. How well does the therapy work? How well has it been established to work? The conventional therapies for medulloblastoma is one of the true success stories of pediatric oncology in that it allows a curative potential in over 75% uh, of patients that May are May I interrupt treated. you just real briefly? Because I saw some of the children that were cured by this treatment. I saw them. They were mentally retarded. They couldn't talk. They couldn't speak. The cancer supposedly was cured, but the child was a vegetable. Now, I'm not sure that that's what those parents envisioned when they went through the conventional treatment. And so why shouldn't, and I see my times running out and I'll yield to my colleagues, why shouldn't a parent have the right to choose between a clinical trial that's ongoing and a treatment that might endanger their child's life or health dramatically? Well, first of all, uh, the patient did not qualify for the clinical trial in that the clinical trial is written that patients need to have had progressive disease on standard therapy. This is getting back to the major issue that formulated our decision, and that is the curative potential of standard therapy that has been well tested over decades that has led to the cure in patients. Now grant it, you have seen examples of children that have probably suffered severe side effects. There have been tremendous progress in reducing doses of radiation therapy using different chemotherapy regimens in an attempt to reduce the toxicities experienced by patients in the treatment of this disease. Number one, Thomas Navarro did not qualify for the protocol because it was specifically stated that patients must have had an attempted curative therapy. Meaning chemotherapy and radiation chemotherapy first. Chemotherapy and radiation because of the so, cure. So let me, let me interrupt here. I, I think I understand all this. And so the, the, the child and the parent is taken out of the decision-making process at that point. Either they go along with chemotherapy and radiation and the potential side effects, or their child cannot get the other treatment. Here again, that is, that, that is true, though, isn't it? Our decision is based on a balance. No, I, I understand what you're saying. But, 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 but I understand what you're saying. But what we're saying is the parent is no longer able to participate in the decision making process unless they first use chemotherapy and radiation, knowing full well of the side effects that might occur. Given the known efficacy data regarding antineoplastins in this disease, we cannot substitute it for a known curative regimen that carries with it a why, why, why don't you just give me a straight answer? The straight answer, is, the straight answer is yes. They cannot participate in the clinical trial unless the child has first had chemotherapy or radiation. That is the eligibility criteria of the trial. Okay, now let me just, and I'm gonna to yield to my guys, what if you have a child, you, and the child has this devastating cancer, and this child uh, is, uh, has, has to go through this treatment, and you've done all the reading and research, you've read, gone through the internet, and you've talked to a lot of other parents who had problems with this, and you came to the conclusion that the risk of chemotherapy and radiation was greater than uh, going the alternative route and trying uh, to... What you do? Would you say, okay, we're going to go ahead and take the risk? No. Uh, 
Let me emphasize that I have been in practice for 20 years in medical oncology, and the issue here is the internet and the information that patients get from the internet. We applaud and we want patients to be active participants in their care, but this does not substitute for the experience of physicians that have treated patients with medulloblastoma. I am not saying this in an autocratic, authoritative fashion, authoritarian fashion. Nevertheless, when we made our decision, we contacted leading experts that treated medulloblastoma, and they believe that the risk toxicity benefit versus the known survival advantage was far outweighed. I'm, I'm going to yield to my colleague, but I want to make one real brief comment. I went to Africa, and I got a terrible stomach problem. And I came back, and I had this bug for two years. I couldn't eat properly. I, I had to take everything, Zantac, everything for my stomach for a long time. I read about a doctor from Australia, and he had said for the first time that he believed that the problem that people have with stomach ailments was not caused by nerves, ulcers, and all that sort of thing, but it was caused by a bacteria. And I went down to see him because I couldn't live with what I was going through. And he treated me, and in one week, I was cured. He's now recognized all over the world as one of the leading doctors in his field. And what he said was the H. pylori bacteria does exist and probably 90% of the people in the world could be cured if they just took a, a combination of, of medicines. FDA wouldn't approve it. FDA wouldn't, didn't look at it. None of that was approved. And yet I was cured before that, that, that happened. Now, uh, uh, the, the thing that bothers me is I participated in the decision-making process myself, and I went down there and I, and I was cured. A parent who has a child who's dying of cancer, who knows that the chances of survival is not all that great, who knows the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, and knows that there's another approach, like Dr. Brzezinski's, that is in clinical trials, it's my contention that they ought to have a voice in the decision-making process, and what we see is that, and you say you're not an autocrat, but what we see is we see the agency of government, the Food and Drug Administration, saying to that parent, no, your child's going to go through chemotherapy and radiation or else. And if the child has the side effects that I've seen, where a child is a mental basket case, a, a vegetable because of the side effects of the chemotherapy and radiation, then that's just tough. And I am one of those who believes that the parent if it's a clinical trial that's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, at least ought to have a voice in the decision-making process, and you folks continue to say no, and that bothers me a great deal. But we'll talk about this further. Mr. Horn, you recognize your phone. I'd be glad to uh, yield you two minutes more since you're okay. Uh, number one, I'd like to ask Dr. Whitties, you're at NIH. Uh, is it true that uh, the, there's been a loss of personnel in the portion of NIH where drug development uh, was being reviewed. Is that correct? I'm told almost 30 have been dismissed there or reassigned to other parts of NIH. Well, I don't know what your point of reference is, your time point of reference, but we... Um, Last four months. No, it, it is not true. It's not true. Right. So nobody's been, you know what I'm talking about on drug development and marine plant life and plant life. Correct. There's been no loss of personnel in the last No loss months. of personnel. Right. Well, then maybe some of the uh, newspapers are a little in error. Uh, but uh, that uh, bothered me, to say the least. And what type of a program do you have going on plant life and marine life? Well, we have a and have had for a long time a pretty extensive uh, program in um, that, that, that actually goes out to far corners of the world and searches ecosystems like tropical rainforests and marine ecological niches, uh, soils and so on to try to procure um, examples of 
um, plant, animal, or microorganism life for our uh, natural products repository, which is a repository that actually is a national treasure. It contains about 140,000 extracts of one sort or another, and um, this has actually been the basis for the natural products work that's gone on at the Cancer Institute. And um, a little while ago, a year or two ago, we uh, established a program that um, makes it now available to people interested in screening for compounds outside the institute and actually outside the area of cancer. So it would please us greatly, for example, if people interested in uh, drug discovery and other further serious medical illnesses uh, would regard this also as a, as a repository for them. Um, that, that's one aspect of what we do uh, in this. What's the next one? Well, um, so. Um, uh, there has been in place for a number of years now a screening system that depends on uh, inhibition of growth of a variety, a, pan a, a panel of cell lines. And um, this has been actually very useful in discovering uh, extracts and also pure compounds that might have anti-cancer activity, although the proof of that is always you know, in the pudding, but it's, a, it's an initial screen. Um, we have come to question in the last few years whether that cell line screen is the right way to be asking questions about what might be useful in cancer based on new knowledge in cancer biology um, and have um, uh, big plans actually to try to reorient our approach in the direction of molecular targets but still using the same kinds of chemical diversity that we've been talking about uh, in the past also. Enhanced, however, by some of these new synthetic methods in the laboratory that, that I mentioned uh, briefly in my, in my comments before. Um, we also then have a development program. Now, the development is the process by which you take a chemical that looks like it might be interesting and you turn it into a substance that you can administer to an animal or downstream to a human being. Um, and that involves lots of tests that, that give you reason to think that if you were to give it to a person, um, it would be safe. Um, and it wouldn't cause horrific side effects, at least. Not, not, not initially, uh, depending on how you ended up giving it, but certainly it would be safe to introduce into clinical trials. Um, and also that it has um, the potential to kill cancer or stop it from growing in a whole animal or a person, as opposed just to a Petri dish. And that's a, that's a long, complicated process that involves many steps like toxicology and pharmacology and formulation and things like that. Has there been substantial interest from the pharmaceutical firms? Um, we um, collaborate with, I, I, would, I, would, I would guess probably somewhere between 100 and 200 pharmaceutical companies and also academic laboratories all over the world who, have, who, who submit compounds, unknown compounds and known compounds to our screening systems. And we also commonly collaborate with companies uh, in the clinical development of agents that either we license to them or they want to co-develop with us. It's a, it's a, this is a process that's been um, a collaborative one for decades now, and it's, it's really only going to increase in intensity as uh, industry uh, becomes more and more interested in cancer, which they are in both the pharmaceutical and biotechnology sectors. We hear every time we talk to uh, the pharmacological uh, industry is that they uh, cost them about $300 million in research on that. Now, you're doing a lot of the research. Uh, at the NIH, uh, is there any uh, recompense from uh, the industry when they're successful or maybe when they aren't successful? And uh, I'd just be curious the way, do, are you able to uh, uh, award a particular scientist that is on your payroll at NIH and doing a lot of this or through grants from NIH, is there ever a chance for that individual who's uh, taken a pursued a particular line of endeavor uh, where there's any monetary award? Um, uh, that's a complicated question. Let me answer it quickly. I'm thinking from the pharmaceutical group in um, terms of your contract. Right. So the, the reward system that's in place for scientists who discover things that end up being useful, um, if, if that happens within the intramural program of the NCI, that is on the campus uh, in Bethesda or in Frederick, um, there is, it is now possible for inventors to receive royalties up to a certain level once royalties, once there is a revenue stream from the sale of something that, that um, um, of course, 
for extramural grantees, grantees of the NIH that discover something under grants or contracts, uh, Bayh-Dole, uh, the Bayh-Dole legislation um, allows licensing out, patenting and licensing, and um, they, of course, can then therefore also benefit from a revenue stream once there is one. Um, there is not, uh, in general, feedback, direct financial feedback, however, from drug companies to the NIH, except when there's a CRADA in place, a collabor collaborative research and development agreement, which is a formalized, as you know, I'm sure, a formalized process that um, was actually created by the Congress to enable uh, collaborations between outside organizations and the government. And you feel that's helping maintain first-rate scholars in science to the NIH? I think, I think it's a factor. I think, I think most of the people who work at the NIH work at the NIH because they love it. No, nobody gets rich by working at the NIH. Yeah, it's hard to beat. Uh, you don't have students in a university bothering you either. <laughs> well, some of us like students, actually. Mr. Horn, uh, we'll come back to you in just a minute. Okay. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you uh, for uh, taking a moment and having a moment of silence on behalf of my father, uh, who passed away on Sunday. I sincerely appreciate that, and I appreciate the thoughts and the prayers of the committee. I just have a few very uh, brief questions. Um, Dr. Uh, Wittes, let me just ask you, does NCI evaluate all research proposals by the same criteria? Um, well, c can, you, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? Well, does the MCI hold unconventional and conventional research proposals to the same standards? That's certainly the intention, yes. Okay. You see, uh, the, the reason I'm not simply saying yes is that the, a lot of the evaluation of proposals is done by a peer review system. Uh -huh. which involves committees of experts drawn from the outside. And uh, depending on who you get together around the table to discuss things, you may get a greater or lesser degree of enthusiasm for one kind of thing or another. But the intention is certainly to mainstream the evaluation of complementary and alternative um, approaches, yes. Well, many people now um, turn to the Internet for information about cancer and how to prevent, detect, and treat it. Um, what steps is the, uh, are the NCI uh, taking to make accurate information available on the Internet? Um, we've devoted an immense amount of time and energy over the last few years to that issue. I, I mentioned uh, in my opening statement the revamping of our protocol and information database relating to cancer and cancer research. This is now called CancerNet, and it is um, it involves thousands and thousands of pages, uh, computer, uh, uh, pa uh, internet pages of, of text about state-of-the-art treatments for cancer and about available clinical studies with a new powerful search engine that allows people to put in information that's more closely tailored to their own circumstance, including where they live, by the way, and come up with not only protocols that are, protocols that are available for them for their stage and kind of disease, but also in the geographic area in which they live. Um, we also have a new website called Cancer Trials, which is um, um, full of contextual information about the research setting. So it tells people, for example, about why they should care about clinical trials, what clinical trials are, um, um, what the informed consent process is all about, the kinds of questions they should ask to people. We've, we've, we've really, I, I think, done a much better job over the last few years about, about, uh, in exactly that direction. Now in the state of Maryland, it's estimated that 22,000 600 new cancer cases will be diagnosed this year. And you know, we, this is a, Maryland is not a big state. And a lot of those, uh, that not, a lot of that will take place in my district, which is basically Baltimore City, uh, predominantly African American. Um, and the thing that concerns me is that, you know, we've, we've seen um, articles here recently that show that there are significant racial disparities in the way people are treated for their cancers. Could you describe any efforts by the NCI to determine the reasons for these disparities? Um, yes, that, that, that's another area actually of, of intense interest to us. And uh, we have actually a very ambitious plan relating to cancer and um, the, the disparity of burden uh, of cancer in various segments of our population. Um, we're doing a lot with that now, including the creation of an, an ambitious community, series of ambitious community-based networks to try to create infrastructures in um, areas suffering a disproportionate burden of cancer so that these infrastructures can actually serve as research platforms to ask exactly the kinds of questions that, you're, that, that your question focuses on, which is why is there 
uh, an, an excess burden of certain kinds of cancer. Say, well, we don't have a very good idea right now, for example, of why African American men uh, suffer disproportionately from prostate cancer. We, and, and it's known that they do, and, and we really don't know why. Th these kinds of issues are issues that we really need to get to the bottom of. There are a number of other things that we're doing also, including trying to establish relationships between um, community sites of research that, it, that serve, uh, that are in minority serving institutions, and the cancer centers, the cancer center networks that the Cancer Institute already supports. And we're doing this with the um, Office of on research, the Office of Research on Minority Health, and um, expect that, that kind of fusion between um, um, institutions that are oriented toward the care of minority groups, and uh, on the one hand, and then institutions that are science-rich um, places that may not have been uh, thinking about the particular problems in minorities, that that fusion, creating links there, will be a very productive way of getting people to put this on their radar screens and, 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 and make it a real issue for them. Now, uh, Dr. Pasteur, um, what's the cure rate for children with pediatric brain cancer using the standard care treatment? Standard treatment, uh, and I assume we're talking about medulloblastomas here. Yes. Uh, Depends, I, I, I didn't usually, know whether I could pronounce that word okay. right, so I okay. made sure I got it's the definition. It's in excess of 70%. In some series, it's even 80% or higher. It's a very curative um, disease. Well, what is the cure rate for children when we use Dr. Berensky's treatment? This is one of the problems in determining the uh, adequacy of his treatment. We really do not have adequate survival data because we are dealing with a very limited number of patients that have been entered on clinical trials. Uh, basically, we are taking a look at if we take a look at the number of patients that have been entered on clinical trials, it's in the range of about 17 patients. Uh, the survival data we do not have complete data on because many of these patients are obviously being treated at this time. We do not analyze the clinical trial until the trial is completed. The activity that we have seen uh, using this therapy have included some responses. However, and by responses I mean tumor reductions. But in order to equate that therapy to the body of knowledge that has been evolved really over the decades using radiation chemotherapy uh, is impossible to answer at this time. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, following up on what Mr. Cummins just asked, uh, how many people did you say were in that clinical trial down there, 17? Would I take a look at my... I, I think you did. I'm pretty sure that's what you said. Yes, but the most recent update on the protocol, there are on the protocol uh, in 1999, which is the most recent 17, data, we, we have eight patients on the protocol and nine patients that were exceptions uh, that we entered on the protocol. Well, one of the things that you said when I was talking to you a while ago was that, and I think you just said, now you have such limited knowledge from the clinical trial. That is true, isn't it? It's, we have very limited knowledge. We have 17 patients. I understand, but therapy. you limit the number of people that are on that clinical trial, and yet you, and then after you limit the number of people in the clinical trial, you say you don't have enough evidence. It, you know, I don't understand that. Would you explain that to me? Yes. If you say we don't have enough evidence because we don't have enough people mm -hmm. on the clinical trial, and at the same time you're saying we won't let anybody beyond a certain number on the clinical trial, then what you're saying is you're, 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 you're going to make sure you know the result ahead of time. And the, and the result is we don't have enough evidence from the clinical trial. You won't let them in, so you're never going to get the kind of end result that, uh, that might come out. Isn't that correct? No, it is not. Well, how, how, many, we how, many, pe well, wait a minute. how many people will you, allow, will you allow in the clinical trial? We will huh? allow the patients that meet the eligibility criteria. And that is? Trial. Chemotherapy and, and radiation, radiation first. therapy, yes. Could I and the help? ones that don't die or become vegetables, then you'll allow them in the clinical trial. I think that is a gross mischaracterization of the standard therapy and the results that one gets from therapies that are administered to patients with this disease. Then you I would like to bring up that we have given 300 patients. Then you should have come to our, our press conference and you should have talked to the parents who had their kids there in wheelchairs who were just degenerating into nothing because of the conventional treatment instead of the other treatment that they could have taken. 
We have talked to a pediatric oncologists who are experts in this disease, uh, and they believe that the risk toxicity benefit is warranted in relationship to the cure rate. We have allowed over a 300 patient exception, uh, patients to be uh, exempted and to be treated on anti-neoplastin. So I don't think that we are limiting the access to this drug in appropriate situations. It was after though, after they had the chemotherapy and radiation, correct? This is in a variety of diseases. Oh, but as far as the Medulloblastoma, how many of you had a lot of As I stated before, the number of patients that are on the medulloblastoma trial, there were eight on the trial and nine exemptions that did not fit the criteria for the trial. Why didn't they fit the uh, They could have had minor laboratory abnormalities, etc. Minor, there, lab there, no, wait, there, wait, 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 minor laboratory abnormalities. Tell me what the lab, laboratory it, it, I, I don't have that data. I mean, could it have been a mental problem or a physical problem that resulted from the chemotherapy or radiation? I do not believe so. What do you know? I would have to look into that and get back to you. Well, would you look mention? into it and get back yes, to me? I, I would, would like to know if the chemotherapy or radiation had side effects with those nine patients that resulted in their non-acceptance uh, uh, non into the... Uh, into the program down there. So would you let me know that? I would be happy to. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Strauss, I understand that one of your employees is a Reiki master. Uh, could you explain uh, what that therapy is well, and what the, its role is in health? Uh, he's the expert, and if you're, you're relating to uh, Dr. Morgan Jackson, who yes. we've uh, uh, recently had the uh, good fortune of having him join us, where he'd been the director of minority health studies. Uh, until now at the Agency for Health Research, Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, he's a licensed intern, is trained at Harvard and Harvard Medical School, mm -hmm. uh, and he is also interested in a range of complementary therapies. Reiki therapy, as I understand it, involves manipulation of particular points on the feet for therapeutic purposes, uh, and he is interested in, uh, in that therapy. Uh, and is he, has he had some positive results from uh, the therapy he's using? Um, I believe he has, but he's been with us for about two weeks, and his oh. responsibility is to develop our entire portfolio of research addressing the issues of health disparities uh, using CAM approaches to traditional and indigenous health care systems. Uh, what, what is the role of spirituality in healing as a physician? Uh, do you ever pray with your patients? And if, if not, would you be uncomfortable doing that? I'm just curious. Uh, I'm a religious person myself, Mr. Chairman, and I have prayed uh, when my children have been ill, as uh, many parents do. Uh, and I support and respect my patients' wishes for that kind of therapy uh, and offer them uh, clerical support um, if they wish to pray. I have not prayed in any religious context. Uh, with my patient, my own religious beliefs uh, may be different. But as I say, um, these spiritual uh, efforts are very supportive and comforting patients and families. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding acupuncture and other therapies, do you think that uh, they have been shown to be effective and should be reimbursed by Medicare? I believe that acupuncture, uh, despite its thousands of years of use and its venerable tradition, uh, is an area of uh, still controversy for some indications. Um, it's touted for many, many illnesses. Uh, most of those indications have not been studied at all. There have been uh, some good studies, although not, not absolutely definitive, suggesting that acupuncture is beneficial for certain types of pain disorders and not others. Uh, there was a consensus panel of uh, outside experts convened at the NIH in 1997 who, upon reviewing the literature to that time, concluded that uh, the burden of evidence suggests that acupuncture is beneficial for pain associated with dental extraction uh, as well as uh, an adjunctive therapy for relief of nausea and vomiting following chemotherapy. As to whether the level of evidence is adequate for reimbursement, reimbursement issues are 
uh, are not ones I'm uh, particularly uh, knowledgeable about, but I would say that the evidence for acupuncture for all CAM modalities should be exactly the same as for all conventional therapies. When there's been adequate controlled trials of a prospective nature uh, that says it works and is safe, that should be sufficient. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, pursue some of that uh, drug uh, laboratory situation. Uh, do you see, after several years, maybe decades of this, do you see any major stream that might be the most productive as a result of that laboratory and the grants that are granted in a similar nature? Where are we, in other words, in it right now, in terms of plant life, marine life, et cetera? Um, well, I, I think as, as far as uh, sources of chemicals is concerned, it, it has to be said that the microbial world has probably been more intensively investigated than either plants or the marine world. Now, I say that with some um, hesitance because the, 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 the discovery of whole new genera of, of uh, life, um, the so-called archaebacteria that live in very hostile places like near deep sea vents and so on, plus the increasing knowledge that there are actually very large numbers of organisms that are not culturable by conventional technologies means that there's a whole lot of microbiology that we're just beginning to learn about. And it may very well be that there will be very interesting chemicals coming out of that source. Um, the, 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 the business about plant life in endangered ecosystems uh, has gotten a lot of public attention and, and um, we're, we're doing what we can to collect specimens that are not already represented in, in our repositories. And marine life is also another, um, another area of real attention. And you'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Pettit tomorrow, who's actually uh, made a lot of contributions in, in, in this whole area. Well, I thank you. And uh, Dr. Kang, I'd like to ask you, because your aff affiliation with Medicare, uh, do you advise the uh, health care financing system as to what pharmaceuticals ought to be recognized by Medicare in relation to cancer? Is that one of your roles? Um, I, you have to understand that Medicare actually currently does not have a drug benefit. We certainly well, support the Well, we're going to give it one, is the point. We're going to give it in the next three months. Right. So uh, you'll be doing that. Yeah. But um, I am responsible for Medicare's coverage decisions, and uh, to the extent that there are some, uh, there's a limited drug benefit with regard to some cancer drugs, and I do make those decisions, and I certainly endorse the statements that Dr. Wittes and Dr. Strauss have made that the evidentiary standards for whether certain drugs should or should not be included for Medicare coverage should be the same, and the scientific method now, should be the same. one of the major drugs here that women have to get, which is, what is it, Tamifaxin? I might not be pronouncing the it. Tamoxifen. Right. Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Tamoxifen. Tamoxifen. Uh, is, that, is that approved for Medicare? That is, unfortunately, it's an oral drug and is not, it, it's not a Medicare benefit. And that is something that legislation needs to pass. So, uh, but I will tell you if you Now, a gave, number of health plans, a number of health plans do have that. And uh, so I'm thinking when we'll get to this in the next few months, uh, that I would hope that that would be recognized because there's so many people out there, particularly widows, with maybe only $500 a month in a Social Security pension, their husband's dead, and then this gets to be very expensive. And have you looked, uh, even though you don't have the authority now, have you looked at the range of pharmaceuticals that might well be utilized by healthcare, both physici physicians, hospitals, and the clinics and all the rest that are eligible. Uh, in general, the administration has overall looked at the, the drug benefit and in, in the total package, but we have not gone drug by drug. And obviously, though, if, if we were to get a drug benefit, um, we are, we're in full support of this. And tamoxifen, certainly for the treatment of breast cancer, would be, I think, on the list. So.
Well, I appreciate that, and I guess I would ask uh, Dr. Wittes, uh, when we're talking about Medicare people, we're talking about some of us that are over 60 years of age. So, Don't look at me. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm saying, to what degree have we included them, and I might add the same for FDA, to what degree are people over 60 in some of these particular uh, trials that uh, we hear about from FDA and we see in NIH and universities and elsewhere? So is there a sensitivity to sort of I, making sure the elders? I think this is actually why the president's announcement this morning, um, the um, <laughs> currently uh, roughly um, uh, 30, one third of um, beneficiaries over the age of 65 are participating in cancer clinical trials when we know that it roughly, they comprise roughly two thirds of actually the uh, people with cancer in this nation. So there is somewhat of a lag for the elderly. Uh, one of the barriers to that is the payment for routine costs associated with those clinical trials. And the president announced this morning that uh, Medicare would do that, uh, make it explicitly clear that we do that. And because people enter clinical trials, they don't lose their Medicare benefit. Um, obviously, there are other reasons why elderly may not participate in trials, but certainly we are interested in moving the financial barriers. Uh, is it uh, tilted primarily for women because of the sort of scourge of breast cancer we have in this society? Uh, uh, not, or that is I'm, it, not that I'm aware of, but Dr. No, Mason. we also have a scourge of prostate cancer. Yes, so. I'm, I'm one of those. And uh, I'm zero on my PSA for the last five years. So oh, I thank the people that uh, did it. By the way, uh, one of my urology surgeons had just the situation that the chairman mentioned on stomach upsets, ulcer, etc. And the man from Australia certainly saved him after 20 years. Dr. Barry Marshall is his name, yeah. yeah. Really wonderful guy. Uh, let me now yield if it's okay to uh, Mr. Cummins. Thank you. I'll Incidentally, Dr. Barry Marshall, I understand, has received one of the highest awards uh, of uh, any uh, physician here in the United States for his medical research, and uh, I understand he may be nominated for a Nobel Prize for Science in the future. And uh, if I might, just one second, Mr. Cummins, Please. tell you, I told uh, my stomach doctor in Indianapolis uh, about my experience with uh, Dr. Marshall. And he was visibly angry, and he turned around and walked off. And that kind of surprised me, because I guess the treatment, the conventional treatment that he had been using for years, with which he made his living, was being jeopardized by Dr. Marshall, and it made him very upset. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I didn't uh, have a uh, preliminary statement, but I do, an opening statement, rather, but I do appreciate you holding this hearing. I really do, because I think it's so, it's such an important subject. And I want to take a moment to thank our panelists for all that they do every day to help people live the very best lives that they can and help people live, period. I think sometimes we can get so caught up in what we do that we forget how many lives we touch. And so I, I, I want to express my appreciation to all of you and to all of the people who are associated with you who may be watching this right now. Um, one of the things, uh, Dr. Kang, that I'm just curious about, uh, if we had a drug benefit like Mr. Horn just talked about, and I have just as much uh, optimism as he does with regard to this Congress doing, doing that, um, what, how do you determine, I mean, what kind of criteria is used to determine what drugs would go under that benefit with regard to cancer? Um, I, I'm not asking you for specific, specific Drugs, just what, what do you look at? Do you look at price, do you look at effectiveness, things of that nature? Uh, uh, what I sh uh, under the President's drug proposal, uh, those drugs approved by FDA and their indications, because they've already been labeled safe and effective, would be covered. So that would be one criteria. Um, I think, th in general, we would be very interested in looking at the, um, uh, the outcomes, the health outcomes, and what it contributes to the patient's not only cure rates or quantity of life, but quality of life. Uh, I should say that under the President's proposal uh, currently that those decisions would be made by pharma the pharmacy benefit managers, and, um, but, and uh, 
The point, though, is that beneficiaries should get access to the FDA-approved drugs that have been deemed safe and effective. Now, you know that there are people who, um, uh, who are right now glued to their televisions watching this or maybe watching it later, and they heard the president this morning. Um, and there are people who are sitting there watching us right now who are suffering from cancer. Um, and suffering from other problems. And I know you talked about it a little bit earlier, but, you know, I'm sure they're sitting there saying, now, exactly what does this mean for me? Um, if I've got a problem, what does this mean for me? And how do I now go about making sure, first of all, that I fall in, within the category that the president was talking about? And second, how do I make this work for me? And I think the chairman would agree that if there is something available to the public, we want to make sure they understand it and not have any misconceptions and that kind of thing. Can you just kind of tell us real quick, as if there was somebody looking at this right now, wondering? I think the most important message is that because of participation, um, if someone participates in a clinical trial, he or she would not lose their Medicare benefits. And that's, the, I think, the most important message. Um, we will pay for the routine costs uh, associated um, with, the, with the trials. I, I think that the, the other important uh, message is we will, the President did say that the agency and the administration will work on efforts to actually educate the community because I think there is some misunderstanding about um, uh, what's covered and what's not covered and the last thing we want to do is is beneficiaries should be able to go into trials knowing what the Medicare program will be paying for and what the trial sponsors will be paying for and uh, really understanding their liabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're about to uh, go to our next panel. I just had uh, one more question uh, for uh, Dr. Strauss. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Strauss, you talked about the foot therapy that uh, Dr. Uh, Rake, Rake, Reiki. Uh, I, I think you, you, you're talking about a different subject because Dr. White, of course, Dr. Jeffrey White, he indicated that uh, that the uh, Reiki treatment is uh, energy therapy and, and not foot therapy. So I just uh, you may have been thinking about something else. I just thought I'd mention that. Well, let me say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, reflect my ignorance. The no, fact no, it's is not. We're not. Uh, that I've been uh, hired to be uh, director of the center because of my expertise as a clinical scientist, but my background is in infectious diseases and immunology, and if you'd like to discuss Helicobacter pylori, I'd be happy to entertain you with it sometime. I don't use that word. I use but H. I pylori. Am, it's easier. Yes, but I am not knowledgeable of the many hundreds of therapies. That's why I recruit the best and the brightest to help us develop the pro programs to do so. Very good. One last question, then I'll excuse you. I would like to say to all of you, though, I'd like to submit to you a whole host of questions that we haven't had time to get to today, and I'd like for you to submit them for the record. So would you do that for of us? Of course. And in particular, I'd like to have the backgrounds on those nine people we were talking about earlier. Uh, finally, uh, Dr. Strauss, is there a role for complementary and alternative therapies in the hospice environment? One of the uh, largest uses of complementary therapy uh, is to alleviate suffering from chronic illness, uh, be it pain, be it nausea. Uh, and uh, that, in fact, is some of the most successful uses. Uh, my own background uh, involves a lot of studies of, of chronic pain associated with shingles infection. Uh, and those are the kinds of areas in which one can explore acupuncture. Uh, patients who are chronically ill are often depressed, understandably, from, from that illness. Uh, and the use of, uh, of botanical products that may uh, raise their mood uh, could be beneficial. I would say that palliative care is a huge place. Uh, the NIH has just announced the fact that it has hired a director of palliative care uh, to join us this summer in the clinical center. Uh, she comes from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, where she's had extended experience in this area. 
Very good. Well, as I uh, thank you for your help, let me just say that one of the things that bothers me uh, continually and bothers a lot of other people in the country is that uh, uh, people like Mr. Navarro has had to take the, their loved ones or themselves or their children out of the country to get treatment that they think is going to be beneficial for their families. And many of the treatments that are being used in other countries in Europe have been beneficial that are not yet recognized or accepted in the United States because of FDA and HHS regulations. And I think that's, uh, that's unfortunate because it costs so much money to take somebody to uh, Europe or someplace else or Germany for a treatment that might save their lives when, if it's effective, uh, it, it should be uh, utilized here as well. And one of the things that I've never understood is why countries that have an effective treatment for a disease such as cancer, why there isn't some kind of cross-pollination between that country and the United States and vice versa so that those treatments and those scientists' minds and, 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 and their proposals can't be utilized across uh, uh, intercontinental borders. So uh, I just leave that thought with you, and I want to thank you very much for being here today. And we'll now bring our next panel forward. Our next panel. Oh, and I hope that if you have a moment, you can stay and hear some of the stories that these people are going to tell, because we're going to have patience here. Uh, Mr. Navarro, Mr. and Mrs. Horwin, uh, Dr. Geffen, uh, Mr. Carey, and uh, Mr. DeFries, would you please come forward? Mm -hmm. Please uh, rise. Uh, this is a standard procedure. Uh, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses responded in the affirmative, and um, we'll now recognize um, uh, each one of you for an uh, opening statement. Mr. Navarro, it's nice having you back uh, with us. Why don't you tell us? Uh, how your son is doing and what uh, what's transpired since we last met. Well, and, 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 and I hate to say this, but because of the lateness of the day, if you could confine your remarks to five minutes, if it's possible, we'd really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we speak, Thomas is in therapy outside the United States. And in in spite of the events of the last almost nine months, he's doing quite well in defeating his illness. Do you have a statement you'd oh, like no, to no, make? No. I just, um, I wanted to share something with you before my testimony. You happen to be in luck today because I happen to have a copy of protocol BT29 for your review, which was a new protocol submitted to the FDA on Thomas's behalf. Mm -hmm. that mirrors the FDA-approved trial with the exception that Thomas would be allowed treatment without prior radiation and chemo damaging his body. Is that right? Well, would you, uh, would somebody go down there and pick that up from him and we'll take a look at that. Did you hear what he was talking about? Thank you very much. Thank we'll you, look sir. at that. Do you have a statement you'd like to make? Other than your son's doing well? Well, that's everything to me. Okay, well, well. But uh, in following with your opening speech, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, that I'm a living testament to your opening speech and to the current cancer statistics. <sighs> We're both fighting it now. Yes, I understand. And for those who are in the audience, uh, Mr. Navarro has just uh, discovered recently that he is, uh, has fourth-stage uh, prostate cancer. And so you're in a fourth-stage, so it's, uh, you're, you're in a battle uh, as well as your son. Yes, and, and having three sons, we are 
two out of four males, which is the one in two oh statistic. Well, let me just say we'll, we'll all uh, say a prayer for you and, Thank you, and hope that uh, the treatment you get will be beneficial. And I'm glad to be here and hope that we can break some barriers today. We're going to continue to work on that. Uh, Mr. Horwin. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Horwin. My wife, Raphael, and I would like to thank Congressman Burton for the opportunity to speak about the experience our two-year-old son, Alexander, had with chemotherapy that resulted in his death. Can I have the first slide, please? Today is Alexander's birthday. He was supposed to be four years old today. Alexander was a strong, happy, very intelligent little boy who loved life. But when he was two years old, everything changed. On August 10th, 1998, Alexander was diagnosed with medulloblastoma, a highly malignant brain tumor that represents a quarter of all brain tumors in children. After two brain surgeries, Alexander was tumor free, but we were warned that without further treatment, his tumor would return. We met with the oncologist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and he told us that radiation was out of the question because it would destroy Alexander's developing brain. But he told us his state of the art, and I put that in quotation marks, chemotherapy, would provide a good chance of survival. This protocol was called CCG9921 and was comprised of four chemo drugs, cyclophosphamide, cisplatinum, etoposide, and vincristine. He warned us that although the side effects were not as bad as radiation, they could be severe. Can I have the second slide, please? Heart damage, lung damage, liver damage, kidney damage, loss of hearing, secondary cancer, intellectual decline, ineffectiveness, and death. After hearing this, we continued researching other cancer treatments and focused on the Brzezinski Clinic in Houston, Texas. We spoke to parents of children who were doing well on Brzezinski's non-toxic therapy and decided that this was the very best treatment for Alexander. On September 21st, 1998, Brzezinski met with us, looked at our son's latest MRI, and said that because there was no tumor, he could not treat Alexander. He explained that the FDA controlled his protocols and required that Alexander have tumor in his brain. We explained that our son had suffered through 16 hours of brain surgery to be tumor free. Brzezinski said he was sorry, there was nothing he could do. In Los Angeles, we scrambled for other options, but we were unable to find any other viable non-toxic therapy. Reluctantly, we returned to Children's Hospital for chemotherapy on October 7th. Later, we would find out that the oncologist had contemplated taking Alexander from us with a court order if we resisted. Slide three, please. After the first round of chemo, Alexander began to change. Constant vomiting, hair gone, dark skin turned pale as a ghost. He got sick with fevers and spent weeks in the hospital. There were blood transfusions and hearing, kidney, and liver tests. Antibiotics squirted up his nose, injections in his legs, all standard fare with chemotherapy. Three months after starting chemotherapy and one-fourth the way into a 12-month protocol, Alexander was diagnosed with 30 tumors throughout his brain and spine. We were told that he had about three days to live. We were given decadron and morphine and sent home. But now, with three days to live, Alexander met the FDA criteria for Dr. Brzezinski's therapy. He had measurable t tumor, 30 of them, and he had already had the benefit, so-called benefit, of chemotherapy. We charted an air ambulance. The first time Alexander had been to Brzezinski's on September 21st, he had joked with the nurses, watched TV, and played. Now he was brought in on a stretcher with an escort of emergency personnel. After fighting like hell to live, Alexander died on January 31st, 1999, in my wife's arms. Our son was only two and a half years old. After Alexander was buried, we wanted to know what happened. Why did he die while receiving state-of-the-art chemotherapy? We started researching the medical literature. What we found stunned us. In 1994, St. Jude's Hospital had given the exact same four chemotherapy drugs to children the same age as Alexander, with exactly the same tumor as Alexander. The protocol had to be terminated because 11 of the 13 children had their brain cancers return and spread in an average of five months, just like Alexander's did. 
This was hard for us to understand. This so-called state-of-the-art chemotherapy had already been used before and had failed. Why were they giving this to our son now? We continued our research and found that the chemo drugs that they had given Alexander had been used for over 20 years. And the oncologists were admitting in their journals, in their medical journals, that they were incredibly toxic and ineffective alone or in combination. Here's a sample of what we had uh, written about chemotherapy, a sample of what they had written about chemotherapy. If I could have the next slide, please. This is just a sample. We have over 40 citations in our written testimony. 1985, written by an oncologist, respect to medulloblastoma chemotherapy. Responses are generally transient and virtually no cures are reported. 1988, aggressive treatment of medulloblastoma has not improved survival. 1993, the absolute benefit of chemotherapy for the treatment of medulloblastoma in childhood is as yet not proven. 1994, the median time to progression, return of the tumor, was six months. 1996, the outcome for the majority of children with malignant brain tumors remains poor despite surgery, radiation, and conventional chemotherapy. 1998, for many years, chemotherapy has been utilized for the treatment of malignant brain tumors with minimal su success. This is what oncologists are writing in their journals. We wondered what else oncologists were writing in their medical journals and not telling parents or the public. We discovered that chemotherapy wasn't only toxic, but it was also highly carcinogenic, according to the NIH and the FDA. This explained why some children treated with chemo actually died of a different cancer. Can I have the next slide, please? We wanted to know how the FDA and others could spout encouraging statistics like what we heard earlier, when the children were relapsing and dying. We found journal articles that discussed how response rates to chemotherapy could be found where it did not exist. Others illustrated that a response rate has nothing to do with survival. And others explained that dead children are not counted in the statistics. The theory being that if a child dies while on the chemo protocol, he or she did not have the benefit of the entire therapy and therefore should not be counted. The medical literature is clear. There is no standard of care for this disease in young children. The FDA policy of not allowing terminally ill children access to other therapies is outrageous. It must be stopped immediately. My wife now has some final testimony. Uh, I would like to uh, have your entire testimony and all the slides that you have. I want to send all that information over to the FDA for a, a response from them about that. The doctor that was uh, that made the comments about the conventional treatment, uh, we asked him to stay. He left, and so we're going to make sure that he has a chance to review this and respond to us. Thank you, Mrs. Herwin. Because the FDA did not allow us to use a therapy that could save Alexander's life. We never gave our son a fighting chance to survive his disease. When conventional therapy has nothing to offer, the FDA should not sentence children to death by taking away an option that could save their life. A parent should have the right to work with a doctor and choose the best non-toxic therapy available when their child has a terminal disease. Why does the FDA not allow this? Five days of chemotherapy cost our insurance company between $23,000 and $31,000. Alexander's body was a profit center to the drug companies and oncologists. But chemo is an ineffective treatment in pediatric brain tumors. Faced with a choice, no parent would use it. And that is why the drug companies through the FDA, make sure there is no choice. We urge the committee to take a hard look at the conflict of interest that exists between the FDA, the decision makers, and the drug companies that profit from these decisions. Children should not be used as guinea pigs for profit. Two hours before Alexander died, 
He looked at me and he gave me a little smile. He said, I love you, mommy. Our son was our life. We thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Erwin. I, I know that this is a very difficult time for you, um, but I can tell you that we are checking into the issue you're talking about. We have uh, sent subpoenas to the FDA and HHS and CDC for all of the people who are in the decision-making process. Our staff has spent many, many, many hours going through to find out if there's conflicts of interest. We believe we found a number of those in the advisory panels, and uh, we will be holding a hearing on those in the future and releasing that information to the public once we get through it all, because there's so much of it. But uh, we are looking into it, and you can be assured that we'll get to the bottom of it. Dr. Gavin. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jeremy Geffen. I'm honored to be here today to speak with you about a subject that I care very deeply about and to which I've devoted my entire professional career. I am a practicing medical oncologist and have spent, spent the last 10 years exploring meaningful and responsible ways of integrating the very best available conventional cancer treatments with a wide variety of alternative and complementary therapies. In 1994, I opened the Geffen Cancer Center and Research Institute in Vero Beach, Florida, with the vision of providing leadership in this field by creating a model of what truly integrative cancer care would look like, how it would feel, how it would run, what it would offer, and how it would differ from mainstream centers in the way it cared for people with cancer and their loved ones. My compelling motivation to create such a cancer center appeared in my life 14 years ago while I was a senior in medical school. And that year, my father was diagnosed with metastatic gastric cancer, and he died less than four months later. In a heartbeat, and as always happens with this disease, my own life, as well as that of my father and everyone in our family, was turned upside down and changed forever. A somewhat unusual aspect of our situation was that prior to medical school, I had had years of exploring and studying a variety of alternative and complementary approaches to healing. Like so many other cancer patients and family members, I longed for a place to bring my father where he could receive the very best of both worlds, that is, state-of-the-art conventional medicine, along with alternative and complementary therapies administered in a genuinely open-minded and open-hearted manner. I firmly believed that this kind of integrative care could help save his life, or at the very least, help improve the quality of his life in the time that remained. Although I searched everywhere, I could find no such place, because it didn't exist. And I vowed that one day I would build the cancer center that I'd been looking for. A summary of our approach at the center, including examples from real patients who've gone through our program, is described in my book, The Journey Through Cancer, an oncologist seven-level program for healing and transforming the whole person, recently published by Crown. In the remainder of my time today, I'd like to emphasize two lessons which I have learned in building an integrative oncology program and guiding patients and loved ones on their journey through cancer. The first lesson is very simple, yet profound, and it is this. Cancer almost always challenges the mind, heart, and spirit of patients and their family members as deeply, if not more deeply, than it challenges the physical body. Unfortunately, even tragically, and as we've heard over and over and over again today, this simple lesson is overlooked by mainstream medicine, and most especially by Medicare and HMOs, as well as the major government and university research institutions and regulatory agencies. In the urgent, compelling search for newer and better ways to diagnose and treat cancer with scientifically based methods, and now with alternative and complementary therapies as well, the person who has the disease and those who love them are often left behind. From my years of experience as an oncologist 
and as a friend or loved one of cancer patients, I can tell you with absolute certainty that focusing only on the physical dimensions of this or any other disease will never, ever be enough. Thus, as we begin to embrace a more integrative approach to cancer care, I believe it's time that medicine learns to honor and care for every dimension of who we all are as human beings, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and that we do so with equal skill and integrity. Nothing less will ever provide the healing and fulfillment that all people seek in life, especially, especially when in facing an ordeal as challenging as the journey through cancer. How we can achieve this is the other lesson I would like to very briefly address this afternoon. First and foremost, we need to clearly acknowledge that this is an area that is worthy of our time and attention, in equal measure to the resources that we give to the biological aspects of disease. We need vastly more significant funding and reimbursement for all kinds of modalities of healing that honor and address the needs of the whole person. In my opinion, Mr. Chairman and committee members, there is something very deeply flawed about a healthcare system in which I, as an oncologist, can readily spend tens of thousands of dollars of Medicare funds with the full blessings of Medicare to extend the life of an elderly man with advanced lung cancer for perhaps three or four months, utilizing second, third, fourth, fifth line expensive chemotherapy regimens, growth factors, blood transfusions, CT scans, MRI scans, and other costly diagnostic procedures. But I cannot find $100 or even $50 for an acupuncture treatment, a therapeutic massage, or a private counseling session for a frightened, terrified, single mother of three children who's battling metastatic breast cancer and who happens to be sitting in the very next room. I have faced this circumstance, sad to say, countless times in my career, and I think it is wrong. It is also heartbreaking, frustrating, and I believe very short-sighted on our part as a nation. Make no mistake, the advances and developments in biomolecular medicine that we enjoy in this country are nothing short of stunning and profound, and we must continue to pursue them with great vigor, focus, and intention. In the same way, we must continue and even further expand our explorations of the value and benefits of alternative and complementary therapies. However, at the same time, we must finally begin to address a deep and fundamental issue. In America, doctors are paid to treat diseases, not to genuinely care in a comprehensive way for the people who have the disease. Honestly facing this hard truth is, I believe, one of the most fundamental challenges that lies before us today, especially as we begin to explore how we might create a cancer care for the new millennium. In this process, we must not forget that the system of cancer care that we choose to create will be called upon to, need, to meet the needs of real people everywhere. Not only people just like you and me, but perhaps literally you and me, and people who we know and love who might need that care today, tomorrow, and beyond. In closing, I would like to thank you, Chairman Bur uh, Burton, for your courage in sponsoring these hearings, for your leadership in helping to create an integrative form of cancer care, for opening the minds and the hearts of this government and this country, and for the opportunity and privilege to appear before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giffen. Uh, I just, one real brief comment, and that is uh, there was a movie called The Doctor, I think it was called The Doctor, wasn't it? About a doctor who was very, direct and callous with his patients until he became a cancer victim and went through the whole process and uh, his whole attitude changed. It's a shame that he had to go through that and I think your message, I hope, is heard by physicians all across the country. Mr. Carey. Yes. Chairman Burton and Representative Horn, thank you for the opportunity to be able to address you today. As the Chief Operating Officer of Cancer Treatment Centers of America, I'm, I'm 
ecstatic about being able to talk with you today. Cancer Treatment Centers of America has been providing comprehensive integrated care uh, for patients for over 20 years. And the reason we do this is because patients demand it. This innovative approach derives from our corporate mission and vision and what we look for is figuring out ways to deliver care in such a manner that we can make a difference in the lives of patients, similar to what Dr. Geffen talked about. Our patient-centered and interdisciplinary approach stands in stark contrast to the traditional allopathic gatekeeper model. Although in our treatment setting, the allopathic attending physician retains overall patient responsibility, the integration of complementary oncology services assures uh, better patient outcomes. What we find by complementary medicine and the integration of complementary medicine is we have fewer side effects. The toxicities of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery are much diminished by finding ways to build up the immune system. We also find it's anecdotal, I would admit, but we also find that we have improved tumor response and we have a, a fired up immune system. And we believe that that also contributes strongly to patient outcomes and the responses our patients get. Again, this is in sharp contrast to what happens today in our conventional systems. As the doctor, as the gatekeeper, he's making the decisions. In our centers, the approach is, is that the patient is in the middle of the decision and they choose which services they want and don't want. However, the doctor does, the allopathic doctor does continue to remain uh, in control of their care. Our unique and comprehensive integrated ecology approach does begin with the best of conventional treatments. We do everything from bone marrow transplant, high dose brachytherapy for prostate cancers, uh, to photodynamic therapy for lung cancers, we're into biological and gene therapies, as well as surgery. But we believe that the complementary therapies that we integrate into patient treatment plans by a multidisciplinary team add so much to the value and the outcome and the quality of life of our patients. The National uh, Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine describes complementary medicine as those medical practices not currently integral, an integral part of the conventional medicine. While this is true, that so-called conventional medicine overlooks many of the great traditions in nature and holistic medicine, the integration of these practices is the foundation of our treatment. So again, what we want to be able to do is to take the best of conventional medicine and integrate that with more natural medicines. You know, many patients around the country who are treated only with conventional therapies suffer greatly. They tend to um, sometimes even discontinue their treatment um, because of the side effects of treatment. Um, sometimes it's so toxic and so bad they can't continue. Um, with the use of many of the naturopathic or um, complementary medicine therapies, um, we find that patients can tolerate therapy much better. Recent studies, and you've heard as well today, um, indicate that 40 to 72 percent of all cancer patients utilize complementary medicine or alternative medicine. The sad news is, is that less than 50 percent of these patients disclose this to their oncologist. And there can be contraindications, as you heard today, um, and, it's, and it turns into just, uh, disjointed or unproductive care. Cancer patients have traveled hundreds of miles and in many cases thousands of miles to come to our hospitals. We've had patients from all 50 states and 45 foreign countries. So if the question is do patients want alternatives to just conventional, we would have to say emphatically yes. What we do is we integrate five therapies, uh, uh, complementary therapies into our conventional program without going into a, um, great detail with them. They include therapeutic nutrition. These are therapies that work to enhance the body's immune system and get the body's immune system to be on the attack instead of being one of the problems to their, their potential outcome. Spirituality is another important part of our treatment process. Um, meeting the spiritual needs of patients uh, with, with cancer is critical. I can give many examples of that. Psychoneuroimmunology, or what's also called as mind-body medicine, allows us to be able to de-stress the patient and allow the patient to focus their energies toward healing and getting better. And then we have exercise and massage therapies. We work to restore the highest level of immune function by making the body more physically fit. Cancer Treatment Centers of America is the only hospital 
system in the United States that has naturopathic physicians, uh, practitioners working alongside medical oncologists. And the intent of the naturopathic practitioner is to find natural non-toxic therapies to be able to work along with the allopathic uh, oncologist. And the benefits that we have seen from this is increased in efficiencies of the traditional medicines, uh, the body to heal itself, and reduce side effects. A brief point on reimbursement. Um, in November 1998, the Journal of American Medical Association stated the majority of patients receiving complimentary care paid for it out of their own pocket. What we've created in our, in our society is a two-tiered system. Those who can pay for the treatments or can buy a premium health insurance seek out alternative care, seek out locations where they can get that. Those who don't sometimes are relegated to having to go a conventional route and try to pay for it out of pocket. Because of the lack of Reimbursement for complementary therapies from Medicare and other insurers, the majority of hospitals have been reluctant to finance these therapies. In brevity, I come from Chicago. One of our hospitals is in Chicago. And recently, the Metropolitan Chicago Health Council stated that 50% of the 130 hospitals they represent are losing money. With the Balanced Budget Act, which is going to be instituted in August of this year, they're projecting 70%. With hospitals struggling to survive, it becomes more difficult for them to be able to fund complementary care um, for their patient and to address that issue. As far as the choice issue, at, at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we never make a choice whether a patient should get complementary care, whether an insurance company is going to pay for it or not. We do not believe that the care provider should be put in that position. We believe that it's important to stand up now it's important that we start here with Medicare and then work with other insurances to get these complementary therapies approved. We, we take too long taking some of these therapies from the lab bench to the patient's bedside. And if I could implore anything upon you today, it would be to move with a lot more speed. At the time for action is now. We need to stand tall, make it happen. We need to do something which we coined as the mother standard. We need to do whatever it takes to make a difference in the life of patients. My own mother had a bout with breast cancer, as well as the chairman of our company. If we can treat each patient with the same care that we'd want one of our loved ones, we will do whatever it takes to make a difference in the lives of patients. And I believe we, starting today, can do that. And I thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Carey. I've had a chance to meet some of the people with your company, and uh, I was very impressed with uh, with, with them and, and the work they do. Uh, Mr. DeVries. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Horn. I'm pleased to be before you uh, to discuss insurance coverage issues on complementary and alternative medicine. I am the Chairman, President, and CEO of American Specialty Health. My company is a specialty health services organization for complementary and alternative health care. We provide um, specialty health plans, networks, managed care programs, and discount provider networks for chiropractic, acupuncture, massage therapy, dietetics, and naturopathy. American Specialty Health assists health plans and insurance carriers in providing CAM programs for their covered members. When health plans and insurance carriers offer CAM programs, they currently often outsource the provision and administration to companies like ours. American Specialty Health currently covers 25 million Americans through 68 health plans under CAM discount network programs, benefit programs, and network programs. There has been, over the last 10 years, we all know, a surge in the interest in complementary and alternative health care. Uh, Dr. David Eisenberg's two studies at Harvard University have shown the dramatic increase of interest in, by consumers in, in the use of various uh, complementary and alternative health care therapies over the last 10 years. Basically, in another study uh, conducted by the International Society of Employee Benefit Specialists, they surveyed employee benefit specialists, those people in employer groups and union trust funds who help their organizations make decisions on which employee benefits to cover. Uh, basically, two-thirds of, of those employee benefit specialists expect to see an interest coverage of CAM in the future. 
And that's basically certainly is driven by the consumer interest in, in complementary and alternative health care and uh, the direction we see um, the consumer interest uh, driving employers to, to go ahead and, and offer coverage in these areas. I personally speak with three to five health plans per week that offer or are considering offering complementary and alternative health care services for their enrollees and generally find significant interest. The question really comes up is what approach will the health plan take? Most health plans have a lack of understanding and experience in working with complementary and alternative health care, and many are choosing to start with a simpler approach through a network discount program. And under a network discount program, the health plan does not actually provide a covered benefit program, but offers their members access to a credentialed network of complementary and alternative health care providers, such as chiropractors, acupuncturists, massage therapists, naturopaths, and dietitians. The members still pay, uh, they still self-pay for services, however they are able to obtain these services at a discount from a credentialed pre-screened provider. The CAM provider who participates in these programs we believe benefits since major health plans are promoting and encouraging the use of complementary and alternative health care to their enrollees and giving significant pub public visibility of these programs. Invariably, we see as, as employers have exposure to the uh, discount network programs and they see the interest in complementary and alternative health care on the part of their employees, that those employers invariably uh, come back and, and are asking health plans, well, the discount network was a nice start, but how do we go to the next level and actually obtain coverage for our, our employees for complementary and alternative health care? And we really see that it's, it's, it's coming along three different levels where the, the, the benefits are, are being, and really it's just in the beginning stages, but where they're beginning to be incorporated. The first is really through employer-sponsored health plan programs where the health plans create supplemental benefit programs for, for services like chiropractic or acupuncture, massage therapy, or naturopathy and where employers are able to purchase a supplemental benefit program for complementary alternative health care, much like they'd purchase a dental or a vision program. Second area we see of great interest is Medicare Plus Choice plans. And as Dr. Uh, Kang had mentioned in his written uh, comments earlier, written testimony earlier, that as uh, HICFA provides prospective payment to certain Medicare Plus Choice plans, they certainly have the ability to enhance benefits that they provide for their members. And we have certainly seen uh, Medicare Plus Choice plans who, for example, provide coverage for acupuncture even though they're under no mandate to provide such. A third area in terms of benefit coverage is coming through state mandates where certain states uh, legislatively are requiring uh, health plans and insurance carriers in their states to provide coverage for complementary and alternative health care. The state of Washington probably has the broadest uh, mandate for alternative health care, uh, but there are many other states also. From our perspective, we believe that CAM has become an important part of the Americans' personal, of the average Americans' personal health care system. That when you talk to most Americans now, they'll not only talk about their primary care physician, uh, perhaps a specialist like an OBGYN, but they'll also talk about their chiropractor, they'll talk about the acupuncturist that's treating their mother, they'll talk about their vitamins, herbal supplements, they'll talk about uh, uh, other types of, of complementary and alternative health care. We still have a long way to go before our complementary alternative health care is fully integrated into our health care system, but I believe there's a variety of steps the federal government can take to support the development of complementary alternative health care in our country, and specifically within third-party reimbursement systems. And quickly, those are, number one, the federal government can encourage states to enact licensure statutes and procedures for providers. For example, naturopathic physicians are only licensed in 11 states. Acupuncturist licensure or certification varies significantly among the approximately 30 to 40 states where they're licensed or certified. And these disparities create unequal access to complementary and alternative health care for Americans in these various states. This certainly could be corrected by providing uh, CAM benefits for Medicare beneficiaries, which would stimulate licensure in those states or the consistency of licensure. 
Number two, federal government can support and encourage the accreditation of schools and universities that train providers in complementary and alternative health care. The U.S. Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services ought to explore ways to achieve this objective the way it has for chiropractic. Number three, the federal government should promote and fully fund research on the clinical efficacy of complementary and alternative health care. And this would mean the continued funding and expansion of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the NIH. The federal government should promote tax equality employee benefit plans allowing coverage of CAM benefits like uh, dietary supplements. Legislation such as H.R. 3306, which has been introduced by you, Mr. Chairman, uh, would create tax incentives and equality necessary to create benefits in health plans for nutritional supplements. I personally know of Fortune 500 companies who have expressed interest in obtaining such coverage, but will not because of the tax issue. Number five, the federal government should promote and encourage uh, complementary and alternative health care education at U.S. medical schools. And, numbers, and really, that, those are the, the five areas which I believe would significantly and positively impact uh, the introduction of complementary and alternative health care into third-party reimbursement systems. Thank you for your time. Be pleased to answer well, any questions. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate your, your uh, statement and uh, your recommendations. Uh, Mr. Navarro, I understand you had a brief statement you wanted to make. Uh, feel a little bit more secure now and relaxed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for not following your instructions a little more clearly. Oh, no, that's all right. Uh, as you know, my name is Jim Navarro, and I'm the father of Thomas Navarro, who is a four-year-old victim of cancer. My son Thomas has medulloblastoma, which is a brain tumor located on the cerebellum. He was diagnosed with his illness September 17 of 1999. I cannot begin to tell you the impact the news had on his mother and me and his brothers and sister. To say that it was overwhelming is an understatement compared to what we dealt with afterwards. It was the lesser of two evils. For the evil that was perpetrated against our family was the reality that we as parents had been stripped of our rights to make life and death decisions for our son. You see, we had discovered much to our horror that as parents of a terminally ill child, we were no longer deemed intelligent enough or responsible enough to make decisions regarding our son's care. We had been stripped of our freedom, freedom of choice. So I'm here today in an effort to answer the question that has haunted his mother and me since that dark day in September. The question is, who decides? Who decides which doctors will treat my son? Who decides which medicines will be introduced into his body to fight this disease? Who decides whether he lives with dignity and quality of life or dies as some doctor's clinical experiment? If any of you here today can answer this question, please tell me who decides. Since those early days in September, when Thomas was first diagnosed, we have been challenged as to our capability. We have been challenged as to the type of parents we are. Our integrity has been brought into question. Our name has been attacked. We have been threatened with the loss of our child, not by the disease that he fights, but by the Child Protective Services acting as the strong arm enforcers of the medical community. To me, it is a grievous injustice in this country we call America that we as parents do not have the right to do that which we feel is best for our son. Our decisions regarding Thomas's health have not been made out of emotion, but by the sheer will and determination to see our son survive when all others have said he will not live. I 
I do not want my son kept alive using radiation and chemotherapy so that some doctor can see he reached a five-year survival rate. So that some doctor can say he's a smashing success when in reality history of this disease tells us that he will be left severely damaged as a result of the devastating side effects of the chemo and radiation. In the process of doing what we felt would be best for our son, we have paid a very heavy price. It has cost us our home, our business, and our friends. But it is a price that we would gladly pay again for the results that we have achieved to date. Those results are that our son is winning his fight against his illness, not because of radiation and chemotherapy, but because we found an alternative therapy that has not only shown to be winning against his cancer, but it has allowed him to maintain his dignity and quality of life. Mr. Chairman, I ask that this hearing not be a time of petty jealousies being brought to light in the medical community but that it be a time the world be made aware that if we dare call ourselves Americans, that we be allowed to live as a free people, free to make our own choices, free to pick our own doctors, free to pick our own treatments, free indeed to decide our own destinies. It is time to say goodbye to the old way of thinking. It is time to say goodbye and time to embrace the future, a future of new ideas, a future of alternatives. Radiation and chemo have left in their path a grim testimony, a lineage that my wife and I have seen over the past months of death and despair a path of children left blind, sterile, retarded, mentally and physically damaged by the excellent results of conventional medicine. Mr. Chairman, every child that was diagnosed with my son from the day he first became ill, we have buried. And what discourages me about today is that the very doctor who has sat in judgment over my son and denied him access to medical attention that we choose best and denied him freedom didn't even extend to me the courtesy to stay here and hear me speak. And I've traveled thousands of miles from a foreign country to spend five minutes with you. And I understand he has an important job as a director at the FDA. But I too, like many other parents, have a very important job. And that is that I am the father of a terminally ill child and it is my solemn duty to keep him alive and healthy and happy. Thank you, sir, for your time. Well, I can assure you he'll get a copy of your statement. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, can yes. I just show you something really quick? What's that? As a man of common sense, I'm sure you'll agree. You've seen my son, Thomas. Uh huh. This is his new best friend, Liam. Oh, my. After two months of chemotherapy. Oh, my. It triggered in him a reaction of tumors throughout his head exactly. and broke his jaw. Exactly. Yep. May I show the audience? Sure. using alternative therapies, and this is limb, conventional therapy, two months worth. Which would you choose? Who decides? Thank you, Mr. Navarro. Uh, if you have an extra copy of those pictures, we'd like to have those submitted for the record as well. Let us uh, get on with the questions here. Um, 
Mr. Navarro, uh, let's start with you. Uh, how much research did you uh, do before you determined that your son's treatment should be in the area that you talked about? Mr. Chairman, I have to date read approximately 100 books on neurology, pediatric cancers, brain tumors, medulloblastoma. I've gone through literally every medical abstract that I could get my hands on, and that is from all the major cancer clinics throughout North America and Europe. And I'm ready to challenge the test to become a doctor, I think, at this point. Okay. Since uh, the Food and Drug Administration has denied uh, Thomas access to antineoplastins, uh, what, what did you do? You took him out of the country, is that what you had? Yes, sir, we did. Because of the threat that the different agencies might take custody of your son? And it, it was actually twofold. It was not only to keep him safe from the harm of conventional medicine, but also because we realized, because of the nature of his cancer, that he needed treatment soon before we lost him to reoccurrence. And sir, if I might add to that, um, one of the things that perhaps wasn't clarified earlier is the fact that although they may say they do have a 70% success rate, I think the part that got left out was the fact that they may stop or even destroy the medulloblastoma but what you're not told is, it is the new cancer that the chemo creates that kills the child. Many times they may start with medulloblastoma, but they die of a secondary type of cancer. And I'm sure Mr. Horwin can substantiate that through his research. What, what do you say to uh, the statements made by physicians uh, and those at the FDA that the success rates are so profound for chemotherapy and radiation with medulloblastoma, that it's a uh, uh, standard uh, treatment that should be followed. Same thing, I guess you just said. I would. You challenge it. I would not only challenge that, I would remind you, Mr. Chairman, that genocide was Hitler's standard of treatment for their social ills in World War II Germany and it didn't make that right. We are experiencing a new genocide today. Mr. and Mrs. Harwin, uh, if you had uh, read the papers you put together for this hearing prior to choosing treatment for Alexander, uh, I presume you would have done it differently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, what we did at that point is listen to our oncologist. He said that there was a very good likelihood that he would be able to help our son. But at the same time, he reminded us of the severe neurotoxic effects of his therapy. And when he outlined those to us, we said, gee, um, the treatment sounds worse than the disease in some respects. Um, and we began to look for other things. We found Brzezinski's therapy. We did the responsible thing that parents would do in a case like this, which means do your research, do your homework, speak to other parents, go down to the clinic, which I did. I met with the, the patients. I spoke with them. I met the children. I realized that this was exactly what Alexander needed. We went down there with our son, um, ready to start treatment. And as I mentioned, we were turned away. Um, at that point, we didn't know what to do. We had no other options left. We went back, enrolled him in the chemotherapy protocol. Again, we were reminded many, many times that this was state of the art. It was gonna be successful. If it didn't save his life, it was going to extend his life. So that's why three months into this protocol, when he had, again, this is a point that Mr. Navarro just made. My son was diagnosed with medulloblastoma. According to the neurosurgeons, he died of leptomeningeal sarcoma. It's another cancer. Mm -hmm. He had this other cancer come back. It was 30 tumors throughout his brain and spine, and they sent us home. He said he's going to die. I, I, I presume that uh, that the information that you have, give, that you're giving us, all that research that you've done, uh, 
uh, there's no question you would have handled it differently. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure all of your information is uh, forwarded to the FTA and ask them for a response to that. May, may I have one other thing, Chairman? Sure. Thank you. It, when I talk about standard of care, I, I get extremely frustrated with that because, um, frankly, it's a very irresponsible comment to make that there's a standard of care for this disease. All you have to do is be able to read English to know that there's no standard of care. The other thing you may want to remind some of these folks at the FDA is there's some very prominent cancer hospitals out there. I'll name two of them. One is St. Jude's. The other is Memorial Sloan Kettering. You would imagine if there was a standard of care that it would be practice at both those hospitals. We were at St. Jude's at one point to see if there was something there for Alexander. This is the standard of care right now at St. Jude's. This is a very experienced pediatric oncologist who's been practicing for 20 years, realizes that these children are dying and is doing what he can to try to save their lives. This is his therapy right now. He drills holes in children's brains. He puts in an Omaya reservoir. This allows him to inject chemotherapy directly into the brain. He also does every other day spinal taps for the very same purpose. This is a very desperate measure, injecting chemotherapy directly into the brain and spine. When we asked him about the track record for this, he was, he was a very honest physician. He said, there is none. I asked him about the long-term side effects, the short-term side effects, the efficacy. He had no information for us. My wife turned to him and said, are you going to use our son as a guinea pig? And he looked at her and he said, yes, Mrs. Horwin. So this is the kind of desperate measures this one very experienced pediatric oncologist is using. If there was an effective standard of care, do you think he would use something as desperate as this? I don't think so. Memorial Sloan Kettering, same thing as a doctor there, using what's called ABMT, a toggleless bone marrow transplant. The idea behind that is you give a child such high-dose chemotherapy that his bone marrow can no longer produce blood cells and he will die. So what they do in preparation for this is they actually take bone marrow, they store it in a freezer, they take it out forcibly, store it in a freezer, give the child very high-dose chemotherapy, bring him to the brink of death, and then, quote, and this is in their language, they try to rescue him. They try to rescue him by giving back his bone marrow. Only problem with this one is if you read his articles, anybody can do it who can read English, the death rate from the treatment itself is 8 to 10 percent. That means almost 10 percent of the children die from the therapy. They give this kid, these kids such high-dose chemo, and they die within a couple of days. That's a pretty desperate measure. Again, if there was an effective standard of care for this disease, you wouldn't have experienced pediatric oncologists in leading cancer hospitals using such ridiculous methods. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Horwin. Um, Dr. Geffen, uh, do you think we can move to an integrated approach to treating cancer uh, uh, and not be required to use chemotherapy and radiation. Do you think that can happen? And do you think it should happen? You're an oncologist and you use chemotherapy and radiation, I'm, I presume, in, as a, in conjunction with others. Do that's you think right. that there's alternative therapies that could be used that would okay. not necessitate the use of those? From my experience uh, over about 10 years, practicing oncology, what has become very clear to me is that chemotherapy and radiation are not the problem. Um, if you were to ask Lance Armstrong, for example, his opinion of chemotherapy, he would have a completely different view. It saved his life. He had metastatic testicular cancer. Chemotherapy and radiation cures many, many, many people. But it's very clear from what we've heard today and from what we know that there are perhaps equally as many people, if not more, who it doesn't cure. And I think what's needed is the, is the honesty, the humility, to admit that we are very uh, handicapped in our ability to treat many cancers. But let's not discount the areas where we have phenomenal success. So I don't think the problem is chemotherapy. I think it's, the problem is when it's used indiscriminately, when it's used in a rigid, formalized protocol. As I said earlier, the problem is that mainstream medicine focuses on the disease. The goal is to get rid of the disease, and along the way, the person with the disease and their loved ones, as we've, as we've heard, are left behind. And we've heard some very moving examples of just exactly that problem. I believe it stems from the basic orientation of our healthcare system, which is one which reimburses doctors to diagnose and treat diseases, rather than to ask deep and meaningful questions about how can we really help this human being besides focusing on what's their tissue diagnosis and what are the current standard protocols calling for. And I think that the, the problem won't be solved until we decide as a culture 
that our goal really is to love and care for people and, and not at the expense of scientifically based medicine, but in a context of love and care that says we don't, and in which we're honest and say, you know, we can't solve this problem, but we can explore any modality that can help and we will. Ms. Marlowe, do you have any questions? Find this. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your efforts to hold this important uh, hearing on uh, integrative uh, oncology. This last panel is exceedingly moving. Uh, certainly, I'm someone who represents the National Institutes of Health in my district and the Food and Drug Administration in my district. And I know that we do have that office. Uh, and I recognized and, and appreciated Mr. DeVries the suggestions that you gave that I marked up, um, and you, the others perhaps all agree with it, where he mentioned the need for further research that, that should be done. Um, research on clinical efficacy of the uh, complementary and alternative therapies seems to me also full information is necessary too. You, you, we need to do more with educating the public, educating our medical community to be open about it, and um, uh, I think with the full information, I think we need to look into credentials, history, official information. Um, it, it, there's just so much more we need to do, and I think this is what you have pointed out with this very, very moving hearing. I continue to have some questions, but I will be following those in terms of what's being done at our medical facilities and what's being done in states in terms of various kinds of licensing. So I thank you for being here and, and uh, sharing with us your very moving stories. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership throughout on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Morella. Let me uh, go to uh, Mr. Carey. Uh, what things can Medicare do to improve the reimbursement structure uh, of uh, the integrated oncology? Basically, to, to include things that Mr. DeVries said that many other insurers are waking up to, and that is, is the fact that many of the naturopathic and complementary things that we're talking about um, are not that much, they're not that expensive compared to conventional medicine, and the patient outcome is, start, is, is better. So I would say the licensing of naturopaths as in 11 states to keep pushing that forward, and then to cover some of the complementary things like psychoneuroimmunology, nutrition counseling, vitamins, botanicals, etc., need to be included. Speaking from a hospital operations perspective, many hospitals are having a hard time doing that. We at the present time included in our therapies, regardless if it's a Medicare patient or anyone else, even though they don't pay, but that's becoming more and more difficult. And in talking to my colleagues, and in telling some of the other hospital administrators that I relate to, they're telling me they would like to provide more therapy, but they're not able to for financial reasons. You know, I, I think it was Mr. DeVries that uh, uh, a while ago was talking about some senior patients. I think it was you or Mr. Carey, I'm not sure which. When, and uh, they were going through chemotherapy and radiation at an advanced age and maybe some other treatments as well, or maybe it was Dr. Geffen, I can't recall who it was. And had they, had they uh, uh, maybe had some complementary therapy uh, along with it, the, the problem, uh, their life, quality of life would have been better and they might have lived longer. And, and I presume you were talking about massage therapy and the other therapies, uh, maybe acupuncture and other things that, that went along with that. Uh, I don't know if there's any clinical studies or anything that would bear on this, but can, when all these things are done together, do people live longer? I mean, do we have any statistics or any empirical evidence that would say that somebody who gets a combination of these treatments instead of just a standard treatment would survive and live a, a longer and better quality of life? I, I, whichever yeah, one of you want to my answer, my answer would be it's still anecdotal. We don't have large enough sample size, but every patient um, that goes through it, the quality of life is improved. Um, on things that we have a, a sample sizes, um, it indicates that patients are doing better by having those treatments. As Dr. Geffen was saying, 
you know, chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery benefit many patients. The problem is those things are toxic on the body. They, they pull the body down. And by building up the body's immune system, by making it stronger, it's able to tolerate those treatments better. And we also believe there's an immune response. And so you believe that, uh, you believe, although you don't have statistical we, evidence, but you believe they I, do live longer and Yes, I, I would like to see more funding come into locations like Dr. Geffen and to cancer treatment centers in America where we can prove our point. If we get stuck in phase one and phase two trials forever, we're never going to get it to the bedside. And there's going to be more and more cases like the Navarros and the Horowins um, in the future. The longer we wait, time is an issue. Well... You're not saying this, but I am. And one of the things that concerns me is that the conventional wisdom and the, the pharmaceutical companies and the other people who are involved in, in, in helping in the quality of medicine uh, have a vested interest in maybe keeping some of these uh, practices going on. And uh, the new alternative therapies that could be combined with conventional therapy are being left out like an orphan child because of the almighty dollar. And, and I know maybe you guys can't say that, especially Dr. Geffen, because he's a, a physician who might uh, be in jeopardy down the road from some, uh, some medical entity. I don't know who it might be. But, uh, but it does concern me. It concerns me a great deal. We ought to be concerned about the pharmaceutical companies creating new and better drugs that can help improve and extend the quality of life. But we shouldn't keep ourselves in a mold that we're in right now when there's new therapies that are coming along that, when added to the conventional therapies, can, uh, can do a better job. And I sometimes think that uh, maybe the FDA and other health agencies in this country are... Uh, maybe inadvertently uh, controlled in part by the pharmaceutical companies and so we don't get these new therapies and these new, uh, these new things added to the mix and I think that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But we're looking into that and I can promise you we're going to continue to look into it, look into conflicts of interest and all that sort of thing to try to get, uh, get it cl as cleaned up as possible. Does anybody have any final comments because I think we're about ready to wrap this up. We'll start with you Mr. Navarro. Mr. Chairman, I promise to be brief, but I just discovered uh, Thomas's consent form for radiation and what the doctor said he would face. Hair loss, skin redness, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, loose BMs, fluid in the middle ear, hearing loss, hypothyroidism, spinal growth deficit, loss of IQ, memory loss, secondary tumors, hypopituitarism, low-level hormones, and radiation necrosis, which is a disintegration of his brain matter. This helped make the decision that we made to the look for a safer plan. The doctor gave you that and said that those were the side effects that one could expect. Pardon me, sir? The doctor said those were the side effects one could expect. Yes. Okay. Anyone else have any final comments? Dr. Yeah, Geffen? I just wanted to say, you know, um, not only am I not afraid to speak the truth, but in fact, in my testimony today, I said that I really believe one of the most fundamental core issues that sooner or later we're going to have to confront in this country as we're involved in this discussion of how do we proceed in a, in a way that makes sense is the fact that in America, doctors are paid to treat diseases. They're, we're not paid, we're not honored, we're not trained, and we're certainly not reimbursed to care for people in a comprehensive way. And so it is impossible to, to overestimate the, uh, the overbearing influence of that on every decision that's made in the medical environment. And I'm, I'm not condemning physicians because I believe most physicians are genuinely motivated by a desire to help, but we're operating as physicians in a healthcare system that is fundamentally crazy in, in many, many respects because our interests of caring for a person are in uh, opposition to Medicare regulations, insurance regulations, reimbursement structures that don't allow us to really care for the human being. We have to make a diagnosis and prescribe a drug and move on. And that is a fundamental issue that sooner or later will have to be looked at. Very good. Anyone else? The last comment that I would like to make is the, the proton, the, the photon and the neutron that hit the, that hit the tumor do kill the tumor. The problem is, as he said, the side effects are what are so draconian.
but through naturopathic and, and CAM therapies, we can alleviate that. You don't have to have as high doses, or you can pinpoint it more closely, or you can take uh, other therapies and botanicals that have an offsetting effect. Similar to what you said related to your stomach, we have similar things with cancer patients. In our Seattle practice, um, we had patients that went through very extensive bone marrow transplant, and their quality of life was so poor, um, treated somewhere else, but treat, uh, so poor that they did not, they did not, they were thinking of having, sui they had suicidal ideations, they had all kinds of problems, but we were able to alleviate the, the uh, side effects and, and, and the results of their conventional therapy through naturopathic medicine, through CAM therapies. It would be so much better if our, if our integrated healthcare system could be providing that at the same time. So you get the therapeutic effects of CAM therapies at the same time you can tie in conventional and alleviate the, the, the radiation therapy, the surgery, um, the chemotherapy by using more CAM therapies. You know, uh, I, I will be uh, contacting people at the Food and Drug Administration, the doctors and others, and some of them are still here. And, it, and I've talked to some of the people uh, from your facility, and uh, they have told me that where chemotherapy is concerned and radiation, that sometimes they'll give smaller doses over a longer period of time spread out, and in the interim, they'll give vitamins and minerals and other supplements that stimulate the immune system so that while the chemotherapy is killing the tumor or the cancer, the, uh, the, the body's uh, immune system has been boasted. And it seems to me that's something that uh, our health agencies ought to take a look at, whether or not just a bombardment by conventional medicine is going to solve the problem, but whether or not it should be maybe extended over a longer period of time along with the, the, the supplements that you're talking about. Yes, we find that patients can tolerate treatment much better. Patients that couldn't take the high doses of chemotherapy can take it over time much better, tolerate it, and the tumor response is very high. And as you said, the immune system is fired up and it, it gives you a better result. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here. It's been a long day. I apologize for the time that we were on the floor and had those votes, but uh, you've all had so much to contribute. I know that some of you have suffered a great deal, and uh, uh, our heart goes out to you, and we will try to continue to uh, be vigilant in trying to bring about some positive change. Thank you very much. We stand adjourned. Next, day two of a congressional hearing on technology.